board study session. And I ask for roll call to establish quorum, please. Clerk Osborne. Present. Member Perry. Here. Member Malczewski. Here. President Vickers. Here. And Member Kelly has not yet arrived. Would you please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance? Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Zoe. I'd like to uh, ask if there are any changes or additions to the agenda. No changes. So I'd ask for a motion, please. Move. Second. All those in favor, aye. Opposed. Carries 401. The first item we have, item four, public comment on a non-agenda item. And before we begin, I would just um, say, when we begin public comment, uh, we will not take more speaker cards. So if you did not fill one out and you wish to speak, um, if you could do it now, that would be helpful. Are there any cards, Clerk Osborne, on non-agenda items? Yes, I've received one. I'd like to call Sherry Morgan to the podium. Oh, yeah, is there an on button? How oh, awesome. Good evening. Uh, my name is Sherry Morgan. I'm a 32-year resident of Laguna Beach and a 19-year parent in the district. I'm here tonight to address board policies. Uh, board policy 9310 states that the board shall review policies annually and goes on to state that the board shall identify the needs of revisions of an existing policy that the, the need may arise due to a change in board membership. So thank you for your vol for volunteering your time. Um, Joan, I would like to announce your last name, but I'll butcher it, so I'm not gonna try, but thank you for volunteering your time. This process is an opportunity to reclaim the oversight of the board through policy review and consider evaluating past board decisions. Prior board member and president, Carol Norman and Parker is on record as stating, we are a weak board. Member Kelly has also on record as saying, we are a weak board and entrust the superintendent to guide us. They and that of long time and once recalled President Vickers led the board in the failure to open our secondary schools during the COVID fall of 2020, keeping our students without in-person instruction for 13 months, which has led to a cast testing result showing a 10% decline of our students meeting the standards in English and math, 18% at the high school. Nearby capital only saw a 3%, 3.9% decline. Great leadership generates great results. It's imperative that this new board majority reclaim the leadership of the long and oversight long relinquished by the past two boards. This is the opportunity to start upholding existing bylaws beginning tonight. Board policy 9322 states that the agenda shall provide members of the public the opportunity to address the board on any agenda item before or during the board's consideration of that item. Questions and comments regularly arise from the community during a presentation and they're never given the chance to ask questions throughout the pr presentation. Policy 9100, annual organizational meeting, electing a board president. It should be against board policy to bypass a board member. As elected official, it violates the rights of the community to suppress an elected official's abilities to represent their constituents. It's concerning that at the December 15th meeting, under the encouragement of Superintendent um, Valoria, member Vickers was voted in as president of the board. Per bylaw 9240, ongoing and continual training is encouraged and budgeted. Therefore, any needs, the, any needed training should be met with the means and the budgets to create the opportunity for Osborne or Perry to step in into their overdue rotation to guide the board through the coming year. This is on record as a superintendent's suggestion. Anyone concerned yet? There's also terms of office, board members request for information, um, and a reminder that the board has been elected to represent their community, not the superintendent. And I encourage you to listen to the board, to the community tonight and their concerns, and especially concerning is the fact that 
the presentation that's going to be coming up earlier later tonight has been anchored behind a per Uh, any other comments on non-agenda items? No. Thank you. Um, Clerk Osborne, do you have a count of how many cards we have submitted? I do. President Vickers, we have approximately 25 speaker cards. Okay. When we go forward, uh, normally we have three minutes for each speaker. Uh, is there an interest in the board of having it be two minutes instead of three minutes? I would I'm asking the board members, please. I'm asking the board members. I would support just as clerk. I'd like to hear at least an hour of public comment. I'd like to make time for everybody in the room that came to speak to have time to speak. So I would suggest to this board that we uh, reduce the time to two minutes. That would allow us uh, 50 minutes of actual speaking time and probably up to an hour or more of, of public comment. I would I would like people to have three minutes because I know some people have practiced and written it out and it's very hard at the last minute to cut things out but I assume that if something has already been said then the speaker won't say it again. Member Kelly you. you have a comment? I support Member Osborne uh, on two minutes so that we can get everyone in. Mm -hmm. Dr. Macheski? So not having done this before I don't have experience to draw on in terms of thinking this through, but I, I would like to prioritize getting as many people to speak as possible. So I think that that's a good approach to take. Thank you. Uh, we usually have 20 minutes on a topic, so we would need to extend it anyway by vote. But the uh, I also agree with Clerk Osborne that I would hear rather hear all the speakers than have some speak longer. So there seems to be consensus on the board. So we'll begin with a two minutes. And member Clerk Osborne, would you call the first speaker, please? This is on our one topic for tonight for discussion, our study session topic of uh, facilities planning. Okay, so just to confirm, um, President Vickers will call each speaker to the podium for two minutes. And uh, Ms. Weber will have the timer up set for two minutes. And then when the timer goes off, if I could ask, ask each speaker to just stop talking um, and uh, go ahead and uh, move from the podium so I can call the next person and that'll allow us again to hear as many comments as possible. Um, if you submitted a written comment, thank you for those. We got over uh, between 70 and 80 written comments as well. And the board has reviewed those. Um, people that submitted written comments, um, you'll be called to the podium after the people that had not submitted written comments. So just to give everybody a little bit of um, information on how we'll call the cards. Okay. All righty. So the first speak. Oh, Excuse sorry. Me. Is it... There will be a presentation. The, the order is to take the public comment first, then we receive the presentation. Well, we received, as Clerk Osborne stated, we received over 70 comments electronically today on the present, on what's proposed. And you will, but the comments, the comments proceed. Yeah, this is how the, this is how each of our meetings works. We open up the item for public comment before the board hears the information and then deliberates on it. So we're going to move forward uh, with the first speaker, Laura Jumani. Could you please come to the podium? And Ms. Weber, will just start the timer once you start talking. So thank you. Hello, I'm Laura Jumani. I'm a 20-year resident of Laguna Beach and an 11-year parent in the district. I have an eighth grader at Thurston and a 10th grader at LBHS, and I love our schools. I'm here in support of upgrading our outdated aquatic facilities. One, we need a larger regulation size pool for our water polo teams. And two, we need more capacity to serve our LBHS sports teams, age group water polo and swim teams, swim lessons, and community lap swimmers. My 10th grader is on the LBHS water polo team in the fall and winter seasons, and the LBHS swim team in the spring season. Additionally, she's on a club age group water polo team and practices three days per week at a larger pool in Lake Forest. 
She started on the 10U age group team in fourth grade and along with her teammates has won several junior Olympic national championships. Many of her recent LBHS teammates and those before her have gone on to play division one college water polo at amazing schools like Princeton, Harvard, Brown, Stanford, UCLA, USC, Cal, UCSB, to name a few. And three are gold medal Olympians, Aria and Mackenzie Fisher and Annika Dreis. Southern California is the hub of this international sport, particularly for women. Yet we can't even host home high school league games at our pool. And our athletes have to travel to out of town pools for home games because our pool isn't regulation sized. Recent home games were hosted an hour away at Los Alamitos High School at their upgraded aquatic facility or at CDM or Newport Harbor High School. I'm the booster rep for the high school girls water polo team representing 24 athletes, 50 parents and four coaches. I can confidently say these constituents all support an improved high school aquatics facility. Thank you for your awareness of the need to invest in and modernize our aquatic facilities to serve both our student athletes and the community. Thank you. Thank you. A point, a point of like order before we begin, would you please not applaud for the speakers? Uh, thank you. And member Osborne, will you call the next speaker? Okay, I'm gonna tell you, um, we have Mike Thomas coming and then following him, Charlotte Riches. And again, if you could hold any type of response, that'll help us move along. Uh, go ahead, Mr. Thomas. Hi, uh, good evening. My name's Mike Thomas. I am the assistant varsity boys soccer coach at Laguna Beach High School, and I've lived in Laguna um, since 1998. I'm currently president of Laguna Beach Football Club, which is actually a soccer club um, that brought home its first state championship this Saturday. And we have over 200 players and their families that represent um, our town um, regularly. I just wanted to remind um, the board that, um, forgive me if I'm wrong, that there were no um, floodlights on any of the proposed new field spaces that um, I could see. Maybe I'm wrong, as I say, but we've been squeezed through no fault of anybody's in that we are expanding the um, sports program. We have a, a wonderful middle school intramural program now that's going on. And it is meaning that when it comes to the winter in particular, everything has to be done and dusted by 5.30 as we only have one lighted field in Laguna Beach. So I am putting it to you guys that if we want to expand a sports program and provide a facility, low level, Two hundred to three hundred thousand dollar LED lights can light up a whole field, not impact, as far as I'm aware, the wildlife and anything else that people may um, decide is a situation that needs addressing. But I really want to make sure that moving forward, that at least one, probably two, of our fields um, need to have lights if we are going to accommodate the. Um, growing sports program which is amazing in Laguna Beach for you know football there's rugby there's girls and boys lacrosse now and the field space is just getting thank you next speaker Charlotte Riches and following uh, Miss Riches is um, uh, Elizabeth Hanauer Hi, um, I'm Charlotte Riches. I've been a water polo player and swimmer all four years at LBHS. I'm a senior and a year round lifeguard at the pool. And I'm also an age group coach for the LB Water Polo Foundation. So I'm pretty aware of the aquatics community and how dominant it is. Um, I'm here to mainly represent the girls water polo team. And I just wanna highlight that all, for all four years, for all four seasons now that I've been with the high school, we've had to revert playing important matches at other schools due to the fact that our community slash high school pool is well below regulation size. This past season specifically, we had to play majority, if not all of our home games, including our home CIF quarterfinal game at other schools um, as far away as Los Alamitos High School, which is 45 minutes to an hour away. Not having home games at our own local pool makes it really hard for us to have fans and overall removes a sense of pride and honor that playing at a home pool grants us as players. 
So I, as well as the hundreds of female water polo players in this historically successful girls water polo program, strongly support the construction of a regulation sized pool in Laguna Beach. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we'll have Elizabeth Hanauer come to the podium and that will be followed by Ethan D'Amato. Hi there, I'm Elizabeth Hanauer. I first want to say how supportive I am of a substantial investment and in upgrade to the facilities and I'm excited to see how the proposed plan progresses. A few thoughts on the plan. Regarding the Aquatic Center, I think it's great to have both a 50-meter pool and a 25-meter pool. If the idea is that these two pools should serve the needs of both the school district and the entire community, then I think the following needs should be taken into account when assessing whether the two proposed pools would be sufficient. First is the obvious need of the water polo community, which I'm sure lots of others will speak on. Second is ensuring that there's enough space and access time to allow for a local club swim team. Too many kids are driving out of town to do competitive swimming, which doesn't make a lot of sense given the location of our community. Third would be to include one to two diving boards. I drive my daughter out of town to take diving lessons at the Crown Valley Community Center and see a ton of Laguna kids there. Offering a diving board or two would enable introductory lessons to kids interested in exploring the sport, allow high school divers to practice, and allow the high school to possibly host diving competitions. It seems this would be a real win to both the high school divers and also the swim team, which collects points from diving competitions. An important consideration adding a diving board would be the depth of the pool. 12 feet is needed for a one meter board and 13 feet for a three meter board. Fourth is to make sure that there's a recreational component to the 25 meter pool. If the thought is that the pool is going to serve the entire community, be great if some features can be added that would make it appealing to families and widely available for public use. If the thought is that the school would be using both pools for a large portion of the time, I think it'd be good to know this in advance so that, so that another city owned pool can be included in their own long range facility plans. Finally, I noticed that there aren't any proposed beach volleyball courts in the plan. Given our beachside location, we could field a nationally recognized beach volleyball program, and I know this sport was added to the high school. It's currently difficult to get sufficient practice time and tournament time at me. Thank you. Next speaker. Thank you, Elizabeth. If I could have uh, Ethan D'Amato come to the podium, and uh, he will be followed by Kurt Wilson. Good evening. Uh, my name is Ethan D'Amato. I grew up here in Laguna Beach, attended Top of the World, Thurston, um, graduated from Laguna Beach High School in 2000. I was the water polo coach and swim coach. I'm still a swim coach, actually, from 2006 to 2021. Um, I'm here to support the upgraded facilities. I've been proud to have been a part of this community for the last 32 years. I'm not here to talk about the success of our aquatics programs or how many kids have gone on to universities, which we've had some success and we've been able to send kids to schools. But what I'm here to talk about is that I feel that our community deserves better. Our current students, the children of the future deserve better. Uh, what I learned at Laguna Beach and one of the reasons that I became a coach was the value of hard work collective responsibility, and having a family away from home that I could count on. In my opinion, our kids deserve better. The young kids shouldn't be practicing till 9 p.m. at night. Our athletes shouldn't have to go to travel to play home games. Um, we should have a swim team that's going regularly. Um, I could go on and on about the limitations that we have in our current pool, but when you look at communities that are just outside of our communities and the facilities that they have, we are behind. And I think our community deserves better and our athletes deserve better. So appreciate your consideration in this matter and um, hopefully we can make something happen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. D'Amato. I'm gonna call forward uh, Kurt Wilson and he will be followed by John Schneider. Go ahead. Hi, my name is Kurt Wilson. I reside in San Clemente. I am a, uh, the dive coach for uh, Crown Valley Divers and have been for 35 years. I've been involved in diving my whole life. And I, I know that everybody in this room and everybody in this community realizes the impact and importance uh, that sports plays in uh, child development and uh, time management, character building, uh, any of those things that uh, people are better people because of the activities that they get involved with. I strongly urge that uh, any pool considers a diving element because diving, of course, is an Olympic sport. It's part of a swimming and diving team. 
Uh, it is also the greatest character building sport there is. Uh, if you've ever gotten up on a five meter, looked over the edge and realized these uh, seven and eight year old kids are jumping off for the joy of it. Uh, it's, it's wonderful to see. But this is something they do on a daily basis. Uh, anytime they dive, they're doing something they've never done before. Uh, that is tremendously empowering. Uh, I also want to paint a bigger picture, not just building a facility. It's going to take money to build anything. But if you put a little bit more money into something to where it can host events and bring money into the community where people are staying in hotels, they're going to restaurants, they're shopping in the community. Uh, there are several examples of that that I can show you. I want to offer myself as a resource as far as diving and uh, what you would need to do to create something that would be a jewel and a benefit uh, to the community, not just as, as an asset of something to use, but that can actually generate uh, money to take care of itself and uh, not be a drain on the facility. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Thank you, Mr. Wilson. The next one is uh, John Schneider. Please come forward and he'll be followed by Regina Hartley. Hello, my name is John Schneider. My family, my wife, Caroline, and our three daughters live in Laguna Beach. Uh, we moved here in 2014 and were quickly introduced to the sport of water polo. Since then, we've spent a majority of our weekends and weeknights at various pools across California. Our experience in the sport has been nothing short of life-changing. Over the last 10 years, a high level of self-esteem and self-confidence that my girls have developed in large part due to the sport in Laguna Beach. My daughters have been inspired by the coaches and Olympic players that they come in contact with every day in the pool. Next fall, our twin daughters will be attending their first year of college as a result of their hard work and the guidance that they received from the incredible water polo talent Laguna Beach. Each will be playing D1 and water polo in college. Our daughter Lauren will be attending USC and our daughter Jordan will be attending Michigan in fall 2023. Pool space has been a problem from day one. Over the years, we have driven our kids to Aliso High School, Merica High School, Dana Point High School, Toro High School, San Juan Capistrano, and others that I can't even remember. Uh, when we did practice in Laguna Beach, they didn't practice at 9.15. And for a 13 and 14 year old, that's pretty late. The girls and boys have had to leave Laguna Beach Water Polo Club when they turn 50 because there's no pool space other club, they have to go to other clubs in other towns. Unfortunately, we can only host two games a year in high school because of other sides of a pool, which you've heard about. And each of our girls, each of my girls have been injured multiple times, broken noses, cracked ribs, uh, concussion, just from trying to have so many kids swim at the pool at the same time. When the flip turns, it's just so tight. Uh, I'm here today to encourage you to continue the path that you had the foresight and leadership and wisdom to start discussing a few years ago. We need to continue to enable the development of our strong and capable young people in this country, state. Thank you. Very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Schneider. Uh, Regina Hartley, if you could come forward and uh, she'll be followed by Sarah Durand. Good evening, I'm Regina Hartley, 23 uh, year resident of Laguna Beach and about 15 years in the school district. Um, I have graduating senior and had one last year. Um, I would like to, uh, while I understand the need for the upgrades in the sports area, especially swimming uh, and soccer and perhaps tennis, I'd like to know what the board is going to do to encourage um, more enrollment in the school district to warrant an $88 million uh, expense uh, in view of the um, declining enrollment and the 18% reduction in test scores. Um, I recently worked in the Garden Grove uh, School District and their test scores are way higher than Laguna Beach and their uh, local um, capita, uh, per capita income is way lower. So uh, I think Laguna Beach can do better and I like to know what you're going to do to increase enrollment and to upgrade our academics. Thank you. Thank you. All righty, uh, Sarah Durand, if you could come to the podium and uh, Mrs. Durand will be followed by Steve Samuelian. Hi, I'm Sarah Durand. I've served as the executive director of School Power for the past five years and I've had kids in the district for the past 14 years. I wanted to express 
School powers thanks to the school district for housing our foundation staff. We are flexible about the location of our office space. We are currently at 811 Manzanita above the pool and it's been a great space for us. We're looking forward to making some tweaks and improvements this summer and happy to stay there. We're really excited about the 733 St. Anne's building transformation to the Family Resource Center. Our goal was for that building to be used by more of the community for student and family needs. And we are thrilled to see that vision come to fruition. I appreciated the opportunity to be, to be part of the initial committee who did site walks of all the school sites. Many things were brought up at the different sites, all with student first thinking. I'm happy to see the current plans reflect so much of what was discussed. Most importantly, I'm energized to see our administration thinking big about our school facilities. I am hoping the community as a whole can be open to working together to execute some of these big ideas that will benefit our students. Whether or not it's exactly the plans presented tonight, it will take open minds and an overall community mindset to put our kids first. I think we can all agree that students will benefit when athletic facilities are improved, counseling space is expanded and classrooms are modernized. I also think the plan shows ideas of how we can better use land currently housing district staff for the benefit of st all students and the community as a whole. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next up is Steve Samuelian and he will be followed by uh, Sai Bassett. Hi there, my name is Steve Samuelian. I am a 35 year resident of Laguna Beach, proud parent of six uh, graduated students through Laguna Beach School District, and now nine, seven of which grandchildren, which are, are in our school district. And I'm the School Power Endowment President, which is they've recycled me again, and um, and also happy to serve on the Facilities Committee with the, with the district. And as such, I want to uh, commend the board on taking a long-range, comprehensive, strategic look at all of our planning needs. A couple of things that were clear uh, as we reviewed all of our facilities and visits is that the district has a great team for keeping and maintaining our existing facilities. And I believe they've been very wise stewards of the monies that we've set aside for maintaining our facilities. If you walk around any of our facilities, our four schools, they are in great condition. And I appreciate that. Um, as I see it, it's extremely rare that a community project can check so many boxes for so many different groups of people. Um, we've heard from a lot of the aquatic community today, but I think it's also important to note that by adding this 25 meter pool in here, it also checks boxes that the city has. And so that would be desirable. Um, the parking facilities, obviously parking is always a problem in Laguna. This doubles the space of parking at the high school. So I'm hoping that neighbors will be uh, relieved in some way for parking um, and, um, and again, for visitors to the community. Um, the high school and district office buildings have been long overdue for renovation, modernization, and expansion. This plan calls for a combination of those buildings together um, to be able to use reciprocal areas and be able to create an efficient space tennis facility, and um, we have. Thank you. All righty, so we have uh, Sai Bassett uh, coming forward. And after Sai, we have, is that how you pronounce your name? Oh yes, that is Sai. Okay, Sai's. thank you. Um, we have Susan Elliott. My name is Sai Bassett. I am a senior at LBHS and one of the two PEP commissioners this year. I started on Laguna's varsity water polo team for the past four years and have played for over a decade. It is necessary to make these aquatics facilities upgrades. Laguna Beach High School's most competitive sport for boys and girls athletics is water polo. Yet the facility for the high school's most competitive team is not even up to par to play CIF regulated games. Our competitive opponents are unwilling to agree to play games that may affect their rankings at our pool. Upgrading the pool will allow our school to host these high state games. These games will attract more fans and bring Laguna Beach's community closer together. As PEP commissioner, I lead the high school student section and witness the impact that school spirit has on bringing the student body closer together and its positive impact on the players in the games. 
Being able to host high state games will get more student viewership and bring the school closer. Additionally, the upgraded space mimics the typical size of a water polo pool, so our high school's team won't be at a disadvantage when playing against other teams in standard sized courses, which is much longer than our current pool. As a coach for the LB Water Polo Foundation, I have the privilege of working with the up and coming water polo stars. More pool space will allow us allow the foundation to provide a higher level of training for the kids. With the higher level of training, the future of the high school's program will look even brighter than it does now. As I watch the passion of our players during practices and games, I hope they are given the opportunity to play big games at home, an opportunity that I was never given. As an athlete, there's no better feeling than representing your hometown with its support behind you. Board members, I ask that you provide the next generation of Laguna Beach water polo players a chance to make their city proud. Thank you. Thank you. All righty, come, coming up to the podium now is Susan Elliott, and uh, Mrs. Elliott will be followed by Steve McIntosh. Okay, <clears throat> I live right across from the tennis courts. The balls fly out of the court and land on my lawn. So i am got a view of what, what this location looks like probably better than anybody. Um, I've lived here 30 years. My kids were born here. They went to the school. We can walk across. To, I can throw a rock at the high school. This neighborhood is way too small for what people are talking about. You can build all the parking you want, but there's Park Avenue is two lanes with a stop sign right at Manzanita and another one down further down on, on the next street, another one down, everybody's going down Third Street. It's gonna, the traffic's gonna back all the way up to Thurston. If, if meets like what you're talking about, and I, I love water polo. I love to hear the kids swimming. I love walking home as they're outside playing. We'd love to hear their voices on, during meets, but have two pools and people are talking about having hotels and people coming in from out of town. It's just way too small of a neighborhood. And I'm wondering what happened to St. Catharines? Why is that not a thing? Why did we buy that if that's not where the pool is going to go? Um, it just seems like, why put it there? We have a football field that's the envy of a lot of schools. Kids come from other schools to play football on our field where there's a thousand kids. We have an amazing theater where people come to use the theater. Lucky us. We have two um, gyms. Like how many schools with a thousand kids have that? Now we're going to put two pools and tennis courts and parking structures and more administration buildings. How on earth are people going? And we already have Annalisa's. We have an Airbnb. We've got multiple uh, family units down on Lower Manzanita. The streets are always packed. Um, people, yes, we'll have parking, but people aren't going to want to park on the second level because if everybody's getting out and dumping out onto Manzanita and park, it's going to take forever. Thank you. We're going to call forward uh, Steve McIntosh and following Steve will be um, Alana. Hello, uh, my name is Steve McIntosh. I'm a 41 year resident of Laguna and uh, my family and I have been good neighbors to the high school for over 20 years now. And we all realize, yes, we do need a pool. We get that. I'm all for a new pool. We hear it over and over here, but let's just say, look, I'm looking at the bigger picture here. There's more than just a pool here, folks. I'm here tonight to ask the board to scrap this giant proposed facilities project. And remember that 100 million costs today equates to about 200 million by the time construction would start. This project seems like a large Irvine or Riverside Recreational Commercial Complex and a small town school district facilities upgrade. Um, so last week out of nowhere, this huge proposal shows up with no notice, input from neighbors, community, or the city. And yes, we understand that because of a ridiculous state law, school districts are exempt from city regulations, design review, traffic studies, et cetera, and then you can build any damn thing you want. But as a real partner to the community, this is just not the thing to do. We all know that the current pool needs, we'll, we'll get there, that's great. There's St. Catharines, I'm paraphrasing because I'm getting screwed out of a minute. With district and high school enrollment dropping significantly and continuing to do so, there's no way to cost justify a $100 million project that will benefit a small percentage of students. The money is going to come from our pockets. We're still paying for the last school district construction bond through your property taxes, everybody. 
an intrusive project of this scale will have a detrimental effect on the quality of the life of the neighbors, the beauty of the neighborhood and the town, and will negatively impact the value of our uh, homes and properties. Let me ask you guys, would you want any of this in your front or backyard or neighborhood? I don't think so. I thought so. Thank you. Next up at the podium, we have Alana. And Alana will be followed by um, Ali Bishoki. I'm Ilana. I am from Northern California originally, and I was in aquatics program before they had girls water polo. So I'm going to come from that standpoint. People have been asking for an aquatic center in Laguna Beach for many years one that is appropriate and commensurate with Laguna's tradition of a rite of passage for these, for all of these teams, water polo, swim, everything. We have a history of gold medalist Olympians, okay? I'm not wearing this shirt for no reason. The people are invested in Laguna Beach. It's time that Laguna Beach invest in the people and the way the people want them to invest. I worked at the city. I've heard all of the complaints and all of the requests firsthand. Our high school pool is so crowded with swimmers and water polo players that each team has to get farmed out to other communities one day out of their already short week to get pool time. This is not fair to us or the other communities and it's an embarrassment, really. My nine-year-old daughter got involved with the water polo team two years ago. And she always asked me, Mama, why do we always have to go to other pools for all our tournaments? Why can't other teams ever come to Laguna? It's time to answer her and all our deserving teams and coaches with a well-deserved aquatic center. Yes, it will be well worth it, not just financially with more revenue, but also socially and health-wise, providing another outlet for our community. Thank you. Alrighty, our next speaker is Ali um, Bashoki. Am I pronouncing that correctly? Close enough. It's, okay. it's Beheshti. Beheshti. Okay. <laughs> uh, just one minute. Uh, next up uh, behind you will be uh, Shaheen and Samia Sadhal. Okay, go ahead. Hi, my name is Ali Beheshti. I live at 631 Virginia Park. And um, I can't imagine a homeowner being more affected by this than myself. Um, uh, when I looked at the proposed plans, there's six tennis courts that are going to go. My fence line is right next to the school district. Um, I'm here to advocate for my three-year-old uh, autistic son. Um, he uh, has sensory issues, as you can imagine, which are common with autism. Um, the noise level of that construction would likely force us to move, uh, at least during the construction phase. And if it does end up being tennis courts there, um, probably permanently move due to all the noise and sound there. Um, obviously, you know, when we purchased this home, it was our dream home. Uh, we, do, we don't want it to become a nightmare for our, for our son. Um, and, and that's my concern here. When I heard um, there would be a significant investment in the school system, I was kind of excited because currently he has to be bused 30 minutes outside of town and back every day. So he spends an hour being transported because uh, he has special needs because those special needs can't be met here. And I thought with such a large financial investment, maybe uh, there would be some of that in, to treat the most uh, vulnerable members of our community. It ended up um, not being the case, but I just wanted to advocate for him and, and be heard out. Thank you. Thank you. Next up will be uh, Shaheen and Samia Sadhal, and they'll be followed by Nicole Anderson. She wants me to go first. Um, my name is Shaheen Sadhal. I'm a a uh, parent here in the district. I have uh, Samia, um, a seventh grader, and Shamsher, a fourth grader at Top of the World. Shamsher is a competitive diver with Crown Valley Divers in Laguna Niguel. We drive out to Laguna Niguel three times a week for him to take part in that. Um, coach Kurt is his coach, actually. Um, the sport has been a wonderful outlet for him and offers him an incredibly 
empowering experience, particularly coming out of the pandemic. Um, it also gives him access to older athletes that he can look up to um, and something that he can pursue in high school and even college if he wants to. We are tremendously short on aquatic space here and I full heartedly support the um, upgrade of our aquatic center. center. We are a community of water sports talent and uh, we should do right by them. Hi, my name is Samia Sado. I'm a competitive swimmer here and I started my training here in Laguna Beach. I soon fell in love with this sport, but when I wanted to pursue and compete, I had to go to pools in Newport and Irvine to continue my competitive tra training and join a team. If we had a bigger pool, we would have more time for swimmers, and I would love that for there to be that youth team here in town that I could be a part of. I support an aquatic center being built in Laguna Beach, and I would really appreciate if you could take this into consideration. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Shaheen and Samia. So next up, uh, we have Nicole Anderson coming to the podium, and following uh, Mrs. Anderson will be uh, Walter Stender. Go ahead, Nicole. Hello, my name is Nicole Anderson. I'm a parent and a Laguna resident and the board member of Laguna Beach Water Polo Foundation. We are a 501c3 and we run the youth water polo program through the city of Laguna Beach. I sent an email with details, which so many of you kindly responded. So thank you. And I will keep this brief. I also have copies here if you would like with a picture of my son who won third place uh, at the U10 uh, USA Water Polo Junior Olympics last year in the Platinum Division. So we have a future coming up with our kids. Overall, we want to show you our overwhelming support for the pool for three main reasons. First, we need more pool space. Second, we would like to provide additional club water polo teams for our high school kids. Third, our pool is not regulation size and we cannot host any tournaments or home games. To begin, the biggest challenge and downside of our club program is lack of pool space and time. Our youth water polo players must wait till 6 p.m. to even start practice since we run three age groups. We represent 80 to 100 kids on five to six, sorry, five to six teams, and we have to do this during this time. We don't finish until about 9.15. It's simply just too late for young children. Moreover, when we're unable to accommodate the possibility of a 16U and an 18U club team, you heard from coach Ethan D'Amato, who started this program and built it up. And I'm sure the high school coaches would also tell you that they'd love for us to run the club season in the off season. So the high school coaches can continue to train their high school athletes and also have their supplement, their salary supplemented because they do not get paid a competitive wage compared to a school like J. Sarah. Finally, we need a regulation size pool as we're unable to host any USA water polo tournaments. I thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole. Next up, we have uh, Walter Stender and he will be followed by Pat Many. Thank you for the opportunity. I live in Laguna Beach. I live right across from the school district building. I'm a commissioner here in town, so I volunteer and support the community aggressively. I have three children. They're all in various types of sports and activities, both in this community and surrounding communities, because like most people, many of the activities we engage with, there is not local support. That is not atypical. I'm for upgrading the pool. It's a great idea. But the one thing, I'm usually very, very prefer a very fact and data-based guy. This is a $100 million proposal. That's $5 million a year. If we're horrible investors, $5 million a year in perpetuity, in perpetuity, that, this is this not logical when we're thinking about doing with this sum of cash. So first off, I don't know how many people, because I like swimming, my girls like swimming, I'm off for the pool upgrade. I don't know how many people are impacted by tennis courts. I like to see the number. The courts are empty all over the place around here all the time, just by way of example. So I'd like to know how many million dollars this is per person and for the direct benefits of this. Like most people, uh, my kids like ice skating and ice hockey. Uh, I'm, you know, I'd say, okay, let's put an ice hockey rink somewhere around here because it's not fair that my kids got to go all the way to the Great Park, which is a world-class facility. So we're so blessed around here. We have world-class facilities for everything. There isn't any of the things my children do that are in this neighborhood. I have to drive 
because they participate in sports that are esoteric, like water polo. My best friend's son was a very well-known water polo guy from Granite Bay. And you know what he had to do a lot of the times? They drove. We all drive. So I don't think that the driving thing should be on the agenda. It should be cost benefits. And I'd really like to see that because this is a crazy amount of money. And the other thing I'd like you all to do too, if you're going to put tennis courts in somebody's yard, we should all put our hands up and say, I promise to put that sound in my front yard with those neon signs yeah. so I can listen and see those lights all night long, like the people you're going to give it to. That's all I mean. I think that's reasonable. Thank Next you. Next up is Pat Many, And uh, Pat will be followed by uh, Derek Day. Good evening, board. Pat Mena, I have a fabulous, we have a fabulous son, 2017 graduate of Laguna Beach High. My husband attended El Moro, Thurston, Laguna Beach High, class of 71. I'm a transplant. I really don't pay too much attention to what goes on with our district. Um, I am pretty vocal in the city. I do watch our city politics and our board and our building and things. I am a licensed real estate broker. It is huge for us as a community to have a very strong, highly rated school district. It touches so many different aspects of our, of our life here in Laguna. But I heard about this meeting just last minute and so I'm a little bit unprepared, but my gist of it is, is this is a listening session and you're looking at, at a huge build out improvement of a lot of our facilities. And I'm concerned, number one, we have a decreasing student population. I know this because of the business I'm in. I also believe the current culture is pulling away a little bit from public education because they want a little better control over the content, the moral content of their children. So I'm gonna be on top of this school improvement project. We are a very small community. Regionally, we're very small, we're small town. And Laguna Beach High in the middle of residential, Thurston in the middle of residential, TOW in the middle of residential, El Moro's another story. We can't take on this crazy. Thank you. All righty, next up is Derek Day. Derek, um, come on up to the podium and you'll be followed by Gary Kasich. Okay, hello, my name is Derek Day, water polo dad and an underserved swimmer. I have a sixth and an eighth grader at Thurston. One of my kids is in the pool constantly. The other kid is not because we just don't have swimming here. Um, instead of calling it the high school pool, I'd almost like to call it the community center. I'm an everyday swimmer at our pool as well. And whom it serves is not just the kids. The two pool idea is great. One should be way warmer than the other one. We have a much younger population, age appropriate swim team. And then we have an older, older demographic that would really like the 87 degree water versus the 83. So I like that part. Um, the only other thing too, it's fallen apart. Like we're not getting through our county inspections. They want us to remediate. Something needs to be done. That's it. Have a good night. Thank you. All righty, coming up to the podium is uh, Gary Kasek. Thank you, Gary. And you'll be followed by Jennifer Siebel. Go ahead. I was hoping I'd get his leftover minute. Uh, my name's Gary Kasek. I uh, live on uh, Manzanita, so you probably understand my position here. Uh, appreciation to your service on the board. I know it can be a tough job, and I also appreciate the goals and objectives of the special interest groups here with the Aquatic Center. Um, obviously, I pose as presented, I guess the gist of it to save time is the intensification of use. It's just the location of the aquatic center just doesn't make sense from everything that goes along with intensification of use. The real issue I'd really like to spend a moment on is how we got here. This really should be a meeting talking about the goals and objectives of the neighborhood in the school district. It shouldn't be reviewing finalized artist renderings of what look like decided plans and then deciding who has objections to that. If you go back and review the meeting in September of 22, when this first came up, 
the, the, the board discussed creation of an ad hoc committee. And I believe, and I'm not sure from the video itself, I believe it was the acting president at the time or the then current president said, you should put two members of the community of the neighborhood of the community on this ad hoc committee to help decide where we're going forward. The superintendent, basically said, that's a bad idea and refused it. And you can review the video if I'm taking context, uh, comments out of context and said, what we need to do is we need to create our plan. We need to move fast. We need to put our goals on, on paper and then we'll go to the affected neighbors and decide how we can address their concerns. That's just backwards. I think if you would have done it the right way and involved the community first, you'd see a ton more support because a lot of the people that are gonna complain about it being in their backyard, you would have had support from them if you would have involved them earlier and looked for the various alternatives that could have happened. Thanks. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jennifer Siebold and uh, Mrs. Siebold will be followed by Ryan uh, Blocknick. Hello, I have three kids. My oldest played water polo and swam for Laguna and is currently a freshman playing water polo at the Naval Academy. I have a daughter who is a junior here, and I have an eighth grade son who's currently at Thurston and will be at the high school next year to play water polo and swim as well. Both my sons have also played water polo for the Laguna Beach Water Polo Age Group Program. In addition, I'm the Laguna Beach High School Boys Booster Representative uh, for Water Polo Team and represent 37 high school players, 74 parents, all of whom are your constituents. I also represent the alumni players and their parents with hundreds of past players and families. I can say with great certainty that the entire Laguna Beach High School boys water polo community wholeheartedly supports the new aquatics facility. Please consider the following as you're making your decision. Number one, the existing pool puts the team at a major disadvantage competitively due to its smaller size. Imagine if a basketball team practiced on a court where they did not have enough room to shoot three point shots. Number two, because it is not a regulation size, we've already been over this, no league games can be played at home. A water polo team never has the advantage of being the home team. Also, there are many additional hours for the students on buses every single season. Uh, they're leaving school early to play home games that are, you know, 30 to 40 minutes away. Uh, the small aquatics facility has no room for high school students to continue playing club locally when the kids don't play together in high school on club teams that weakens the high school teams. Number four, every single Laguna, every single year, sorry, Laguna loses players to local private schools that have better facilities. We shouldn't be able to retain these players and students. If Laguna doesn't decide to invest, the program could decline. Number five, the Laguna Beach High School has consistently graduated Division I college athletes. Its program competes at the national level with teams ranked nationally. It has done that despite the smaller pool size and despite its smaller school population. Thank you. All righty, if uh, Ryan Blocknick could come up and Ryan, you'll be followed by Ann Gamerl. Go ahead. Okay, great. My name is Ryan Blonick. Um, I want to speak specifically about the proposed changes to the property north of Park Avenue, which is where my home is located. Uh, my house is probably the property that's most affected by the project um, on the south, the east, and the west side. Um, it will significantly affect the use of our house and backyard. I'm greatly, greatly, greatly opposed to the proposal. I'm deeply frustrated and disappointed that no one from your architecture or planning team reached out to us about this project and ways to mitigate the obvious effects that it'll have on the enjoyment of my house. I did not receive notice of this hearing. I heard about it for today from a friend, so I had to rush down here really quickly and deal with this. Um, again, our house is located at 721 Manzanita uh, uh, Drive. Um, currently, our house is elevated on a hill. Um, with retaining walls on the south and east side, the south side of our lot is currently the district parking lot. The east side is the existing pool. Both of these are currently adjacent to our house from a bird's eye view, um, but the parking lot and pool are approximately 30 feet below our yard and the foundation of our house. The, the height difference usually mitigates any negative effects from noise and light pollution from cars in the pool, and we're happy, very happy to be a part of the neighborhood. However, under the proposal, both the pool and existing parking lot will be replaced by multi-level parking structures, and the top level of the parking structure will have cars that are, are parking directly into our home, into our living room, into our daughter's bedroom, into our backyard. It's ridiculous. The noise level will significantly increased due to the new adjacent proximity of the cars. The people getting in and out of their cars will be about 10 feet from our bedroom. Further, the elevated pool noise will be directly in the pool and won't be mitigated by the existing retaining wall. 
um, the existing head or the headlights will start shining into our bedrooms, kitchen, and backyard. I'm very disappointed in the plan. Um, my request is that you commit to using the city's zoning regulations during uh, the finalized design of this project is very important to me. Uh, currently, the way it's designed, there is a zero setback of a parking structure in the backyard of my home. Zero setback. It's ridiculous. A, par a car parked will be right against our property line. My husband and myself. I'd like to call up Anne Gamble. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan, very much for your comments. Anne Gamble, you'll be followed by... Um, I have a card for Mike Gruba. Is Mike Gruba still here? Would you like to be called? Okay, all right. Go ahead, Ann. Thank you. Great. Sorry. Do I have to hit anything? Okay. Hi, I'm Ann Gamerill. Um, my husband and I have been longtime residents of Laguna Beach. My, we live right at the junction of Legion Park and Short. Um, my in-laws live directly next door to me as well. So we have a vested part of this community for a long time. Um, quite frankly, I'm surprised by the scope of the project. It's just not neighborhood compliant. We're a small community. We definitely support the activities at the school. We want to have a voice in this project. Um, you've heard from a lot of the neighborhood that we were surprised by the actions being taken place here. Bring us into the conversation. I think you heard earlier that there's a, a lovely facility at St. Catharines. Maybe we could be looking at alternate areas. We certainly want the school to be prosperous, and that's great for the community. We just want to make sure that it fits the neighborhood as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. Mike Grube, uh, come on up to the podium and you'll be followed by Steve Chichester. Hello, thank you for um, allowing us to have a chance to speak. I have uh, four boys, um, all from age seven to 13 that are in the school district here. And I can uh, say that I'm excited by the increased parking that will be around the, the sports facilities because the drop-offs and pickups are, are quite a nightmare, so I'm excited by that. Um, I also enjoy the pool. Uh, I've been in the master's swim program and routinely we're, it's full. Um, it's exciting that the community enjoys their aquatic sports and I think they will enjoy a larger uh, selection of room. We usually will swim four to five a lane, which is crowded uh, for master's swimming. Um, but I would invite each of you to come down to the pool tonight, even from six to nine and take a look at what is in the pool during those hours. I find it hard to swim with more than five people in a lane, circular. Um, you will see eight to 10 kids swimming toe to foot, foot to toe in circles, just narrowly avoiding each other's heads as they flip turn and come back around. It's scary. Um, and our coaches and our, our players love the sport. They, they, they do the best with what they have. Obviously the success of the program that everyone has talked about, but I think it's a disservice to our kids. Um, and uh, allowing more space uh, for the, the program to succeed would be great. I know they mentioned that the football field is the pride of the community, and I loved the whole city poured into that field this fall when our team was winning and winning and winning. It was so great. Um, but if that field was 90 yards long, we wouldn't have had any of those games. And that's what our water polo community has lived with for years. So um, think about the community building that uh, a proper size pool can do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. So um, next we have Stephen Chidester. Hello, uh, my name is Stephen Chidester. I live on uh, Legion Street, uh, 555 Legion. I've been in Laguna since 1973, attended Laguna Beach High School in 1970. And um, I and our neighbors uh, surrounding the high school and um, district office are just extremely upset and concerned about how we got here tonight talking about this project. Um, you know, you're talking about taking something from us. You're talking about taking about talk, taking the quiet enjoyment of our homes for whatever purpose for pools, for tennis, for water polo, you're taking it. And we have had no notice. We have not had an opportunity to be heard. That's the basis of due process before something can be taken from us. The plan is simply too big for the available space. It will terribly impact the homeowners near district office on Short Street, Legion, Virginia Way, 
and it's simply too big for the open space available. It will change the look of Laguna Beach High School. Now it has nice green lawns. We're going to have a huge building immediately across the street from people's homes. It's just simply not right. Someone said a while ago that we're invested in the community. We're invested in Laguna Beach. I'm wearing it. The homeowners around the, the high school are in, invested in their homes. And I just don't understand why we were not consulted or even noticed before the plans got to this point. Thank you very much. Thank you. All righty, we have uh, one more speaker um, on this item. I have no other speaker cards. Uh, Dr. Canneberg back there, correct? Dr. Keller, okay. Uh, Sherry Morgan, go ahead. Thank you. Um, I appreciate everything that everybody had to say tonight. Um, and a fun fact, um, I have a parent, I'm a parent of a um, daughter who played polo only for two years. So no, I'm not comparing. It, it's a grueling sport. I played the parent uh, game and I thought I was going to drown. Um, but I was a swimmer um, and I do, I am the parent of a member of the 2015 CIF champion men's swim team. And my son holds multiple records at the um, Laguna Beach High School. Um, which you don't get without daily hours in the water. So yes, we absolutely need a new pool, but this is not the plan. And I have to tell you all that the district is misleading you and they are using your legacy and your sport as the vehicle of which they are trying to push through a $40,000 district office sitting on the corner of Short Street and Park. I'm talking to you, Dr. Valoya behind the lighted sign without asking the residents of this community. To a couple of days ago, the high school reported a dwindling um, enrollment as low as 700 people, 700 students in the high school by 2025. So how can you justify a $40 million district office when you have enrollment dropping that low? Yes, we need parking, but you don't need to drop the district office and put a two-story parking structure with lights, with lighted tennis courts on top. Because one of the things that nobody here in the water polo community indicated was any reference to the rest of the plan. Yes, we need to improve and constantly upgrade and constantly take care of our properties. We need to continue to manage our assets. I love Ryan and I love Jeff and they know that. And they would not have omitted schematics out of that plan if they weren't instructed to do so. You have on record our superintendent saying, do not include residents of our neighborhoods in something so disgustingly expensive that it does not use dollars to educate our children. Thank, Thank you, you, Sherry. Thank you, Dr. Keller. Thank you, Dr. Valoya. Thank you, Dr. Valoya. And shared your viewpoints with us. It, I would just um, remind you this is a very preliminary start to this this planning. The facilities committee worked on this with the team of architects, and this is the first that the board has had this presentation together. Same for parents, same for students, same for community members. It's a starting point, and I hope that you will keep that in mind as we listen to the presentation uh, tonight. Thank you. Jeff, are you introducing? Thank you. I'll go ahead and introduce. Uh, thank you, President Vickers. Uh, to provide some context and background about how we're here and why we're here. If you will recall, the first iteration of our 10-year facilities plan was actually established and approved back in 2015. Um, from that point, we would provide annual updates to the master plan, uh, bring it to the board as information, and then action, action every year, um, which continued on uh, until obviously we had a, a delay with the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. At the time, projects, larger projects were uh, set apart at all of our school sites and it, they were part of our capital improvement program. And if you recall, some of those projects included the new classroom buildings at Top of the World Elementary School. We had the science lab conversion at El Moro with the new shade structures. Um, we had, the, of course, the high school stadium, and more recently, we have the project here, the classroom conversion and the turf field uh, behind me. Um, when the pandemic delayed the updates in the annual master plan, uh, we 
we're able to take advantage of that time and contract with Runel Clark Architects, and we have Roger Clark, one of the principal architects from that firm here with us today, to look at a feasibility study of what remaining projects were on the list from the 2015 plan that we had not yet addressed. Those projects included the Laguna Beach High School administration offices and the, uh, I'm sorry, the, the uh, expansion of the transitional kindergarten program. That was back in 2021. Um, so in 2022, uh, last year, um, the feasibility plan was presented to the board. And it was important to note that at the time that feasibility study had found that the, specifically the high school administration offices needed to be expanded based on the initial scope had, that was identified in the plan. And that was primarily to deal with the increased need of counseling and support spaces for students. Um, after receiving the feasibility study that covered the uh, high school admin building, the district office, and the expansion of transitional kindergarten in back last year, the board directed staff to create an ad hoc committee, and we've heard about that tonight a little bit, to take a more comprehensive look at the update to the master plan. Uh, the committee consisted of our facilities team, principals, community members, and of course, Dr. Valoria, and we have two board members that sat on that, President Vickers and Clerk uh, Osborne. In the work, the committee was tasked with identifying long-term demographic trends, assessing current facility conditions, reviewing existing and future programs to identify um, all anticipated facility needs. And we also looked at the feasibility of using St. Catharines because at the time it, the sale had not been uh, done with the city and we just knew it would, would, could be a potential opportunity to explore, which we know has since changed. So I would just say thank you to Clerk Osborne and President Vickers for assisting us on that committee. Um, it was a year's worth of work where we did uh, tour all of the school sites to hear about all the different needs. And I know that takes a lot of time, so thank you. But all that brings us here tonight. Um, the committee, if this is the first time we're bringing back the comprehensive approach that we were tasked to bring and looking at all of our facilities, again, looking district-wide at everything that we had left to do on the old master plan, as well as the needs that we go or face going forward. Um, we anticipate several um, opportunities to engage and modify with this plan, as it is just a plan. These are not drawings, these are not specifications, and these are not projects. This is a plan that we use to set the stage and build forward so that we can address the needs and eventually get to what we'd be in to design. But again, this is the first of many, many steps. Um, and we anticipate that we would and continue our engagement as you'll see in the next steps at the end of the presentation. That is the plan that we have in place is to further refine our planning and uh, bring forward recommendations and projects eventually that we get this master plan updated and have a, another comprehensive 10 year look ahead on projects where we can start planning and eventually get to design. So with that, I will turn it over to our architect, Roger Clark, who's gonna go through our presentation and um, be able to stop after each section to take questions as needed. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, good evening, members of the board, uh, Superintendent Valorio. Um, my name is Roger Clark, principal and president of Runa Clark Architects, and we're honored to be a part of the facility planning. Again, this is a master plan. It is an effort to identify certain projects and certain scopes of work. It is not a design. It is not anything that's going to start immediately or anything. Um, we did do a comprehensive review with the committee. We walked all of the sites with them. And so tonight we're going to identify what came out of that study uh, there was multiple alternatives that were studied, and certainly there can be multiple alternatives that can be studied in the future. Uh, we started looking at uh, Laguna Beach High School and the surrounding properties. And when we talked about that, we built upon what we had done earlier in 2021 and 2022 regarding the district office property and some of the issues and challenges that you had at the district office, one of which is having not having a boardroom that you have to come to a site, an alternative site, as opposed to having it at a district facility. Uh, some of the lack of collaboration, bringing your, your departments together uh, and looking at that. And that all came out in terms of the feasibility study that we did previously. We also looked at Thurston Middle School, Top of the World Elementary in El Moro. And so this just identifies kind of the timeline of what that happened. I won't go into detail because I think Jeff has already outlined this for you. 
in terms of the work that we started doing, uh, first looking at the feasibility of the district office and also uh, actually even further back looking at the, the high school administrative facility and some of the challenges that it has and it really is just a space problem uh, in terms of that building and not having facilities for students in there, uh, not having counseling and not having some of those student services or a part of that. And then that grew into looking at a more comprehensive view of your facilities and then looking at bringing that to the board and deciding what are the next steps. Some of the top priorities that were identified by the ad hoc committee and by the principals and the people that we talked to uh, where playfield improvements was kind of one of the big items. And I think the success of the program that's been developed here at Thurston with the artificial turf field, uh, I think that was a big thing. We heard it tonight also from some of the speakers of the need for improved uh, play fields and areas for soccer, for football, for all of those different types of sports. Uh, and that was a big component of what we were looking at. The district administrative space came from the view of what we talked to you about last fall. Uh, we brought forward a study of doing something on the existing site. Uh, there was a kind of a split vote from the board of, do we want to put more money into an old building? Does it meet the needs of the district? Uh, and so we took a look at a more comprehensive view of how do we start to look at a, a better alternative for that and a new facility? Uh, and we may not have it all right, and this is not a design. And so we're going to look at that tonight and talk about it. The aquatic center, and we've heard a lot about that tonight, and then parking. Uh, how do we get cars off of the streets? How do we provide for parking for all of the facilities from the high school to the district office to those pool facilities uh, and return the streets back to the, some of the neighborhoods? The universal transitional kindergarten, um, we brought that study uh, back to the district actually last fall uh, and studied where do we want to put transitional kindergarten? How do we improve the facilities for them? And what are the impacts from that? Indoor outdoor learning opportunities. How do we stretch the classrooms that we saw during COVID-19? One of the things that was very important is uh, reaching out to the outdoor environment. But there was also mention of how do we improve science education and how do we improve other educational opportunities from nature and from the outdoors? And so that was a part of what we talked about. And then more efficient administrative spaces. And that's really speaking to um, mainly the high school and how do we provide services for students? And it's not about administrators as much as it is about providing those services for students at each of your campuses. So the first one we're going to, to talk about is the Laguna Beach High School and the district office, which is immediately adjacent to it, the aquatic facility is in the tennis courts. And this is a, it's a complex issue. There's a lot of different ways to look at it, but there's a lot of moving pieces and parts to that. Um, and some of it is kind of spearheaded by that aquatic center in terms of looking at this, of what the impact are of putting in the right size pool facilities for the district. Um, but we also want needed to look at the district office, the tennis courts, parking. Uh, then there's some theater enhancements and some other modernization at that site that was identified in the master plan previously that needs to happen also. And so it's not just about those big projects, but it's about improving some of the existing buildings on the site. And then lastly, again, and we talked about this, the, the field improvements of looking at maybe artificial turf on that baseball field to allow for other activities to occur at that site when it's not in use for baseball and improve the playability and the, the use of that site. So this is just a view of what the high school site and the surrounding properties look like right now. Uh, and where the entire area, we looked at it comprehensively with the committee. Um, and we started looking at where could we place these things? Uh, where could we provide for a uh, CIF quality pool facility or aquatic facility? And there's only so many places. The existing site simply isn't big enough for that. And so we started looking at, we placed it on the district uh, administration property. We placed it where the tennis courts are. Uh, there really wasn't a lot of other alternatives for where we could put a facility of that type. And so the, the alternative that was selected started out with um, displacing the existing district office 
And so the need was there to place this somewhere within the district and that corner of the property and combining it with the high school administration, which I'll go ahead and go to on this slide. Uh, the idea there is that they can commingle, they can share conference spaces, they can share meeting spaces. If the boardroom is there, then they can share some of those facilities. And so staff and, and everyone that was a part of the high school really felt that was a strong relationship to have between the district office and high school administration and providing those student functions as a part of that. So that was kind of one piece of that. But what that did was freed up the district office property. And then that opened up the door for how do we put in enough parking and keep enough parking on these sites uh, to adequately uh, serve the community and serve the high school, serve the district office. And so we came up with the idea and really those tennis courts are actually at a fairly low level uh, because the parking is actually almost subterranean. And so they're not parking in someone's backyard or in their in their home. They're actually lower than the elevation of what the district office is right now. And so those tennis courts are lower. There would be fences. Uh, and so we can do sight line studies and those types of things. Um, but there is the idea of increasing significantly the amount of parking, providing those tennis courts. And what that does is frees up the property where the tennis courts are existing for a new aquatic center. And that aquatic center is really speaking to all the things that you've heard tonight in terms of providing facilities for water polo, for diving, for uh, swim clubs and that, and also a community pool. One of the things that we heard strongly uh, was in reaching out to the city was also is we need areas for the community to be able to come to. And so one of the things that was added in this was additional pool uh, as a part of this, which is a 25 meter by 25 yard pool for some of those other activities. Also a 50 meter pool, we can do a moving bulkhead, we can have multiple practices going at one time and provide a world-class facility for your community and for your school. And then we took a look at what do we do with the existing aquatic center property? And the, the idea there was is that uh, we needed additional parking to support all these things and get that traffic off of the street. So instead of impacting the streets even more and impacting the community even more is let's get those cars off of the street. And so that was one of the other goals. I wanna go back just a minute and look at the corner and you see the buildings in pink kind of on the corner uh, of the site. Uh, in order to make enough room for the new administrative building and student services building, we needed to remove about six classrooms and the existing administrative offices. And so that opened up that corner to allow us to at least master plan and not design, but master plan an area that would be big enough for administrative student services center and the district office functions. And these would be a split level building so that right now it's envisioned so that you're minimizing the height and the scope of that. We did do, Oh, and then the last component was the, the baseball field doing artificial turf, keeping it at the level that it's at, uh, but doing artificial turf on that field to provide better usability. What we started looking at was what is this going to look at? What are the impacts of this? And so looking at it from viewpoint, and this is actually from the aquatic center, uh, it's not designed yet. There's no buildings there yet. There's no nothing chosen. It's just looking at how does it impact the viewscape? Uh, what are those kinds of things? And so looking at it relative elevation, the pool is really at the same elevation as the existing tennis courts right now. And so you're not raising that up. You're not putting anything right in the middle of someone's yard. You're actually keeping it at the same level as those existing tennis courts. And actually the fences in that would be lower in that area than the tennis court fences are right now. Um, what we also wanted to look at was what does it look like from those areas? And so we put in a con conceptual sort of rendering here, but it's not meant that this would be the design. That would come later in the process. And one of the things that we're going to talk about at the end of this is the community outreach, and that's really up to the board, but going out to the community to get their input, both on, from a planning perspective, but also from a design perspective of what should these buildings look like? We've not been selected as the architect. We would love to work with you on it, but that comes from a later stage in the process in terms of the design process, separate from a planning process, which is where you're at right now. 
But the idea was is to identify how can we landscape this, make it a better part of the neighborhood. And we just wanted to look at, you know, maybe what this starts to look like. Uh, just from a scale and a scope of what you're, you're talking about, not from a design perspective. So I hope no one gets hung up on, you know, some feature of that building that doesn't match the existing campus. That can all be done later. The idea here with these sort of sketches was just simply to illustrate the scale and scope of what you're talking about. Uh, the goals of this, and I'm going to go back to the plan. I'm just going to reiterate those for just a minute. Actually, I'm going the wrong way. Excuse me. Um, we're to address those needs uh, at the high school for the administrative functions for the student services uh, to replace also those classrooms that were, were taken out uh, to make space for that aquatic center. And that's really the linchpin of this is making the space for that. Uh, tennis courts had to be moved. Uh, and then also keeping parking as at the forefront of what we were talking about, because what we didn't want to do was lose even more parking than what you had now. And in this plan, we're able to even create more. Uh, there was a, a question about how tall those parking structures are. They're actually multi-level and they're really coming in at street level uh, at one side and then at a lower side over by the LDS church on the other side. And so with the, the topography that you have, you're really not going to see those. It's really no taller. In fact, it's probably lower than your existing aquatic center is right now for that parking structure that's next to the aquatic center. That's actually going to be lower. Uh, and so it's just a matter of how do we do that and how do we maximize the utilization, but also provide the facilities that are desperately needed. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and go through the rest of these. Uh, this was a view looking at uh, uh, down park, uh, and then this is looking back up towards, uh, this is actually from the church site, uh, what it would look uh, out towards the, the corner from the district office and the new addition at the high school. Uh, this is looking back up the street. And then, of course, we identified some preliminary costs, and these are very preliminary based on some ballpark numbers. And so what we started looking at, and I don't know if, if your board all remembers or if you were part of the study that was done before, and there was identified about a, a, a 14,500 square foot district office. We actually bumped that number up a little bit thinking that um, perhaps you might want to have some additional professional development, a little bit larger boardroom, uh, because of after seeing the boardroom you have here, this is about 3,000 square feet. You have room for basically a packed house and about 87 seats. And so we bumped that number up a little bit, but that can be fine-tuned as we go through this process. And I think one of the things that staff has made me aware of is just making sure that we have, you know, what we need and not anything more. Um, the administrative offices is going to be a programming exercise that you go through with the staff to make sure that you have the needs of the district staff, the counseling staff, and, and those that are serving the needs of students and looking at that. But that's based on our experience of administrative facilities for uh, comprehensive high schools of this size that are about 8,500 to 9,000 square feet. And that's the first floor of that building. The other floor, which makes up the rest of that square footage is from classroom that we're actually replacing or, or bringing back. Um, the aquatic center, again, I talked about that. That's a 50 meter pool and then a, a separate 25 meter pool. Uh, <clears throat> I have to change, turn to the page because I can't read it. Thank you. Um, the next one is the theater enhancements. And this is some audio visual sound system and lighting systems that need to be enhanced at the, at the existing theater uh, to make it up to date in terms of what its uh, offerings can be. Um, building E modernization is really a couple of labs in the, in the bottom of that building of looking at how do we uh, enhance your CTE programs that are down there and art programs. Um, the baseball field turf update I already talked about, uh, and then the A and B, the tennis courts with the parking underneath that, and then the parking at the aquatic center. And so with that, love to open it up and hear your comments and questions if you have any.
Go ahead, anyone who has a comment or question at, at this point on the section involving the high school district office. Uh, Roger, thank you for your really comprehensive overview. And um, this is great fellow board members to be able to uh, sit in our properly noticed and adjourned meeting to be able to discuss facilities. Um, I enjoyed um, working on this committee and it's been a long road. It has been, um, you know, since your were last year with the, yeah. the district office presentation in um, fall of 2021, which um, it, it was a great plan, but the board didn't get that excited about it. And we sent you back to do more work. So I just wanted to remind the, the board that at the time, just the district office renovation was not met with a lot of excitement. We didn't ask you to go back and um, bring us financing options or timelines. Um, there wasn't there wasn't a lot of interest in spending, you know, 11 to 20 million dollars just to renovate the district office. So that's one um, consideration that I start when I'm um, looking at these plans. That's something that I think is important to remember. Um, something that you said that is really key, I think, to the whole conversation is that linchpin of the pool. So this is a facilities um, subcommittee that President Vickers and I were on to identify where our facilities are not meeting the needs of our students. And um, as a board that's representing our district and our students, I think that's what we really have to prioritize first. And we are um, trying to use every inch of available space to fit that 50 meter pool. The pool is um, coming up on its 30 year birthday. It was opened in 1994 and it's at the end of its life. And I think we heard many comments about that. Um, the pool, does not meet the needs of the students anymore. And so it's, you know, so creative what we came up with, but I think that's where we have to start. If we could put the 50 meter pool on that little backwards L shape that we had, I think that would have been a really easy thing um, to, to do. And so I just kind of wanted to put that out there before we get into any of the other discussions. So that's one of the critical pieces of this whole puzzle, so. I think we all are, no, I better not say that. I really agree that we need an aquatics center, that we need a big pool. I feel badly that our kids can't have home games. And I don't want 10 and 11, 11 and 12 year olds out till 915 at night swimming and then go home. We're doing so much to try to um, work on social and emotional health and physical health and then to blow it and have them stay up too late and not get enough sleep, it doesn't make sense. But what other spaces did we look at to do the pool? I mean, for instance, did could could a pool be done on our bus barn property? Could a you know, I think we were looking at St. Catharines. I'm also concerned about when the pool is built, will we have a pool at all? Will students have a place to swim? Will the community have a place to swim? If I could just address the second question uh, first, whether or not we have a pool would be dictated by how you could phase a, a potential construction project. And none of that is lined out at all right now. This is, again, just the master plan. And when you start getting into design, that's when the phasing and all the mitigation measures would be determined. And um, certainly you try not to, you try to have the least negative impact as possible with any project. But it's not something that we're close to at uh, that, that point right now. Right. We want the least negative impact possible. But I think it's important to know that we have a plan for swimming for the year or two, however long it takes to build this. There would absolutely be a plan, whether that would be having to close the pool and move the swimming or water pool elsewhere, or being able to keep it open through some creative phasing of construction. But there would absolutely be a plan. Mr. Dixon, does the current um, pool overlap with the proposed new pool site or are they, are they in different physical spaces? It doesn't. There's actually is a way that this could be done. Uh, again, I think, you know, what Jeff is talking about is not presupposing any phasing and the priority of the board. That's really up to you how you do that. But this plan was set up and so that you actually could um, vacate the district office, build the tennis courts, and then build the, the pool after that, and then 
displace the existing pool. And so you're not having that impact on your swimming program. Yeah, I would think that would be important, especially since the pool, everybody in the room knows, serves also as the community pool. So it's not just the high school pool. It serves the entire city. Yeah, I think just being sensitive, though, to that's really up to the board to make that decision. And, and just to compare, how many square feet is the district office now? Right now, you're about eight to 9,000 square feet eight. total between both buildings or so all the buildings that you eight have. Eight to 9,000 to go to 20. I Just a comment, Member Perry. I think uh, over the years when the city has discussed anything serving youth, particularly in the canyon, the travel in the canyon is precarious at best. And we are fully utilizing where the buses park at this point. And to trans, that was, that was, I would answer your question as a member of the committee, that was not considered. There was a consideration of actually flip-flopping um, pool where the, it shows the tennis courts, putting that complex down there. And that was eliminated for certain reasons. Well, I was looking for a way to keep the pool open Keep the tennis right. courts where they were, save money because. But you asked the other question really about, hard. you asked the question about what other options we considered. And so we did not consider the bus. We did not consider the bus barn because then you would be having to duplicate that somewhere else. We can't just eliminate where the buses are. Um, I think the other, I'll interject too. The other thing is going back to student first needs. You know, we want to keep our high school um, athletic facilities in as close proximity to the high school. It is the high school's pool. And so um, where at all possible, we want the high school students to be able to access their athletic facilities. So on foot or, you know, maybe a short jaunt, but getting out to the canyon is um, much farther. So that's I, I agree. That's ideal. But I'm very concerned about the money and where that's coming from. So I just have a couple comments and then I want to follow up on um, member Perry's question. So first of all, I, I since I'm you know looking at this presentation, um, I wasn't part of the committee. I'm I'm glad that it's been made clear that there's no design yet and um, some people mentioned their concerns about that and you know that there will be time to you know be able to think about what the buildings would look like and what the space would look like. I also recently I'm just getting to know the the physical spaces and I recently visited the high school office and I raised older kids in an urban area and I was really surprised for a whole community that's not in an urban area um how much we needed to think about those administrative offices um, at the high school. I really think that we need to think in a comprehensive way about how to serve, serve student needs, and it's hard to do there. I couldn't imagine being a student who was upset, being disciplined. There's not really anywhere to go and, you know, kind of divide up the students. And, and so I think that that's very important in terms of meeting student needs. The question I have um, goes back to St. Catharines, which you had mentioned, and I haven't seen the space, but it's come up tonight. So I would love to hear more about the St. Catharines property and what's possible there. Make, uh, make a comment on that. Um, you know, if, if you, well, I guess it was before you're on the board, that we expressed interest in working with the city on that site. Uh, they, the city was offered that site by the diocese because they, uh, of the focus that they wanted that site to continue. Uh, the city did not take us up on our offer. Uh, and for their short term, that was for the actual purchase of the, of the property. They chose to go, it, go for it on their own. On the second part, they... Uh, I've already renamed it, if I, you may have noticed that, but they have short-term use and they are, will be involved in long-term planning, but their recent list of priority projects does not include a pool. And, I, oh, yeah. I'm sorry. So, uh, you know, they have interests that they're looking at and they have a whole community project that they're dealing with on that. And I'm sure that we will be, well, we've asked to be involved in that long-range planning. But it's as far as anything to meet our current planning, uh, yeah. we're not looking at St. Catharines. Yes. Yeah, I think Dr. So, Malczewski, too, if I could add, um, I mean, gosh, wouldn't it be great if that site could fit a 50 meter pool and that could be there? And I don't, I mean, we would maybe be able to host things, but 
It's just the field space that's available is a junior soccer field. It's a U10 size soccer field and it's dropped down below grade and maybe 30 people you know, can park in that area and then you're surrounded by PCH with no other parking. And if you talk with any families that had gone to St. Catharines and what it was like to, to have an event there or have more than 30 people that might need to park, it, it was very, very hard. Um, the other thing that exists is a beautiful, um, I would call it a basketball courtyard there. That's also a basketball court is smaller than a 50 meter pool. And so these are just very loose judgments. I'm not an architect, I'm not a planner. I've walked the site, I've looked at the plans. I don't see any way for the city to build a 50 meter pool there without tearing down a building. And I don't think many people in Laguna would wanna tear down a beautifully new constructed building that's less than 15 years old to put in a pool. Um, so I don't see the, like that linchpin that I talked about earlier, I don't see that solving the problem, but I, I guess for my fellow board members, I wanna make sure we know that we have like chased down every, um, every avenue that we could to find where else it might fit. I think member Perry's comment is spot on. Did we look at the bus yard? Did we look at St. Catharines? You know, are there, are there other places that this could fit without having to reorganize uh, the block, the Park Avenue block? So. As far as it being a shared pool with our high school programs in the city, again, to your point, Clerk Osborne, it removes it from the school site. Yeah, thank you for clarifying. I had understood that the sites, that there wasn't another site, and I just wanted that clarified, that St. Anne, St. Catharines wasn't actually appropriately sized. I have another question about I don't really understand why the surrounding neighborhood wasn't talked to. And I apologize that that didn't happen. That wasn't, uh, why wouldn't we talk to the people around where we're planning to do all of this and for them to just know at the very last minute does not seem right. To be, this being our very first step in the update of the facilities master plan. Um, this would be the first time that the board would see this plan. And then you'll see as part of our next steps is that community engagement piece. Um, usually when you do a master plan, because it's not a design, you have to have something to look at to spark the discussion. And so this is a great tool for that. And that is exactly what one of the next steps are, which you'll see at the end of the presentation. Um, and there's a long process once you go from even an approved master plan, as you know, with our last one, to actually getting projects moving, approving projects, and then constructing the projects. Um, it's a long runway, and we've always uh, made it a point to do our best with engaging all of our neighbors and being good neighbors, and this would be no different. I'm glad to hear that. I know that, and it makes sense that, for instance, water polo was talked to beforehand, and it seems like other groups should have been talked to like the neighbors also. Uh, just a point of correction, water polo was not talked to. It was not part of the, it was not part of the committee. The, we I went from water polo people that they were. Well, then perhaps someone did not give you accurate information. I'm speaking as a member of the committee, the ad hoc committee. When we toured the school sites, each principal spoke to their site. Now that would be the principal and also included was the uh, athletic director. They spoke to their site, just like they did at Thurston, at El Moro and Top of the World. But specifically, there was no reach out to anyone connected with any sport as far as a booster organization. I had just to follow up on Member Perry and Dr. Kelly, you haven't had a, a chance to talk, so I'm gonna make this really short, but Mr. Dixon, to Member Perry's comment, what would a community outreach meeting look like? And if the board directed you to do that, what? Can you give us some some color on what you would do? It would. It's yet to be determined, depending on what we're looking at in terms of a master plan and potential scope. That would determine the amount of outreach and the type of outreach we do. Um, so it's not something that we ever have a, a template on how we want to engage the community. It's really going to depend on what the projects would look like, um, and then we take it from there. Could we do it more informally? Like this is a, a, a formal board meeting, right, where the board is discussing their their ideas, their concerns, their questions, but that type of meeting, residents would be able, uh, parents, students could ask you questions directly. Certainly, and okay. you see that as one of the, what we call in the next steps is, is those town hall style meetings. Town hall, okay, great. 
Professor, <clears throat> Mrs. Osborne, um, we can direct the staff as far as what we want them to do in this realm. And I think that we will do this. Um, this is the third study session that I've been uh, at concerning the upgrade of the property. So this has been going on for three years. And at the last one, I was the most vocal person about how awful I thought the plan was. And so I was grateful to you that you went back, involved board members, and came up with a plan that we can debate about, talk about, and it's going to have a long way to go before it ever comes to fruition uh, with a lot of your input. Um, I also knew about the St. Catherine's property uh, before it uh, went to the city through my Catholic contacts at the diocese, and I tried to uh, get the word out that I thought this was uh, uh, an excellent property for the school district, and it went in line with what the intention of St. Catherine's was as an educational institution. Um, I even wrote a letter to the editor in January 20th of 2020 um, regarding, I hope it's 2020, 2023, uh, about uh, the big issue in town was the parking structure and parking and building on the Presbyterian church. And I came up with some ideas. And one of the ideas was moving the administration building of uh, the school district to St. Catharines. Uh, I thought it would have uh, low impact on the neighborhood over there. Uh, it would uh, allow for the parking lot to get larger so that there could be more parking for the neighbors, for the city, for, for, for visitors. Um, I wrote to each of the, the councilmen. Uh, two were kind enough to write me back a short note, uh, but I got nowhere. But I thought that St. Catherine's property was really the, the best move for us. And it would have uh, allowed us to move the administration building. There'd be no loss of services uh, uh, during the time that this was going on, but that's all I could do. Uh, so what we have now, uh, as someone who was really against the last one, I'm pretty supportive of what we're trying to do here as a plan and a master plan over a number of years. I may be dead before uh, it comes to fruition, uh, but I think there's great ideas here, and I think we need to work them out as a community as far as uh, what's the best for the neighbors, what's the best for the students, what's the best for the, for the community. And so I'm glad that we're starting at this point and that I will be, I'm interested to continue as far as on my fourth and my fifth study session on uh, uh, the master plan uh, to the end of my term. Thank you. So our student okay. board rep, please. Good evening. So as the student board representative and just to voice on behalf of the many, many high school students I've spoken with, I've genuinely not heard anything but strong support for these much needed upgrades. There's many issues as we've heard, such as parking, as you all know, for our students and our community and pool space is a strong issue. There's just, there's just not enough space for our world-class players to play competitively, safely and efficiently. So just comprehensively on behalf of the students that I've spoken with, and maybe just to clarify the earlier question of the water polo community being reached out to, for me personally, the only water polo community I've reached out to were students, if that answers any questions. Um, but just the improved courts, the community pool, expanded parking are just all great aspects that our students at the high school believe that our school and community really need. Thank you. Are there any other board questions or comments before we move to the next section? I wanted to maybe make a suggestion or run it by the board based on some of the feedback we heard today. Member Perry asked about the square footage of the district office. Um, we had a, we have about 10,000, a little less than 10,000 feet right now. And in the plans, we have 20,000. So I'm wondering if we can give, if there was a consensus to give some direction for Renal Clark when they um, bring us back another version of this to maybe scale that back. And the, the reason behind my thinking on the pool and tennis side, we've had pool and tennis there for a lot of years on the uh, short, short street on the tri triangle piece of the district property that is new building. And so if we were able to scale back the square footage slightly, maybe we would come um, away from those streets a bit and maybe we don't need all that space. Um, I do think that, you know, we're, we're I'm fine meeting 
see here. I have to kind of crank my neck a little oddly, but I don't think that we're trying to build the district office to have a boardroom. If we did, we would have built that down on the, you know, on this plan. I think the idea is like maybe student senate or other groups could use that space, but maybe maybe we need to give it some direction to scale that back so it's not so much square footage. And I leave that to you guys. When you look at the last page on next steps, yes, uh, that is not specifically identified, but at, when we get to that page, bring it up. bring that back up. Okay. All right. Thank you, President Beckers. I have a question about the pool. Is the pool currently up to earthquake standards? Because it's a 30 year old pool that I don't think a lot of standards were in existence at the time we built that pool. And I, I asked that question because I would like that to be one of our priorities as far as uh, in uh, how we go forward. Do you want to answer that? Um, it would not meet current seismic standards. It met the seismic standards when it was constructed and when it was built. And so there's been changes in the law due to earthquakes and research and that kind of thing. And so it would would need improvements if you were to go in and modernize and upgrade and make significant improvements to that facility. Another quick question. To add the diving part to the pool, would that be an issue? To the existing pool? Not the existing pool. No, actually not at all to add it to a new pool facility. Like the, one of the speakers talked about, you would really just put a 12 to 13 foot deep well in one kind of one corner of the pool, add the diving boards and that could easily be accommodated. And uh, Mr. Dixon or, or Mr. Zeta, could you guys talk about the amount of money that we do need to spend or that we're planning to spend to modernize the current pool? Or like if there are, I know we just had a study done, is there a, an amount that needs to be spent just because it's aging? I think like you pointed out, the pool is about 30 years old and we just did a recent review. We did an audit, a maintenance audit of the pool uh, in partnership with the city staff. And it came back with a number of um, uh, number of maintenance work that does need done. It includes replastering the pool, retiling the pool, replacing the pool deck. So many feet back from around the edge because it's cracking and rusting through. Um, so the list goes on and on. It's really at its life and it needs extensive repair work, which we have known about and it's been tracked in our master plan, which you've seen in the past years. It's been earmarked for out in the future and we're, we're getting to that. We're about a year or two out from it. I think it's maybe 2024 or 2025 in our plan. So um, it's been identified. Um, we were prepared to do that work and it's, it's, it's coming due in the next you know, you know, one to two years if we want to keep the pool um, in, in good repair and, and functioning. And to member Perry, to your concern, when you do that work, you shut down the pool and it's, and it's not quick. So it's um, a consideration yeah, we're, also. We're, we're currently working through some immediate maintenance that's done because we do maintenance every year to keep the pool operational. But this year there will be another plan shut down, most likely later this spring right before the start of summer in order to make some improvements that are necessary to keep the pool operating and meeting health department standards. And, and just by comparison, even though that specific point wasn't brought up, uh, when that pool was opened, uh, it was a significant upgrade. And for many years until CIF regulations changed, it did host the matches at that site. If you notice the scoreboard in the back, that was um, a fundraising effort because we needed to do that to comply with what CIF required for keeping the timing of the matches. It's a specific water polo scoreboard. So I just I just feel a responsibility to say that, that the district and the aquatics task force at that time was aware of meeting the needs for a competitive pool at, at the school site, but things change. And that's a lot of years. Thank you. Yeah, and I, I think if I heard some of the comments correctly, I don't think that they've been able to compete in it since 2018. So I think we're now, you know, we had the pandemic years. And so we're, I mean, this has been a, a non-regulation size pool, a need that's been unmet going on its fifth year. So I don't disagree had, with that. I just, yeah. but you're going 30 years back. I mean, yeah, we had was, a lot of years where it was okay. Um, that's definitely, a, and I know also from just keeping aware of what's in the community, that there's been an ask of the city a number of times for the need for another pool. 
and uh, the city has looked at, I mean, they, they had one that where they were planning to do down at Lang Park, and that was met with significant opposition, and that plan was shelved. Thank you for sharing that, and thank you for all the work on the 1994 pool for whoever is out there, because this is not easy to get a new pool built, so kudos to the city and the school board at that time. We did partner with the city, and that's why it's a community pool. Uh, okay, a couple more questions. Do we have any other alternate funding sources for any of the things on the high school before we leave this topic? Well, um, I think we hinted at maybe retrofitting dollars, but aside, like, are there any other things that we should be aware of before we move on from here? Most um, most of that is unbudgeted or partially budgeted if it was included in the facilities master plan, but not to the extent that you're seeing. Okay, great. Do you want directions to the staff at this to the end. Thank you. Is there possible funding from the city for the shared use of the pool or the parking or? We don't know, but that is some of the direction we would like to get is to explore that because I think as the board has told us in the past, we want to explore all possible funding uh, available outside of our general fund and we're committed to that. We've had ongoing partnerships with the city for many years, in fact, to maintain the pool. We have a shared 70-30 arrangement with the city. They present the city paid for. Should we move on to Thurston? Okay. Thank you. All right, Thurston Middle School. Um, so some of the things that we looked at at, at Thurston, a beautiful campus and well-maintained as you come onto the site. Um, but creating the outdoor learning areas and enhancing some of the outdoor learning areas that they have. Uh, some of the main courtyard enhancements of providing some shade and some things for students out on that, that campus. Uh, there was one project that was identified for a, do we, we want to wait or go ahead? Yeah. All right. When the gymnasium was built a few years ago, um, several years ago, uh, there's kind of an issue with the, the bleachers in that facility. And so the sideline of the court actually doesn't allow for the bleachers to be open and still have full play of the court. And so one of the things that we looked at is a small expansion of the gymnasium. Um, another item that was brought up was kind of reimagining there's a computer lab kind of right actually right over here on the back of the library and making that into a makerspace and enhancing that in terms of kind of a pre CTE program or, or I guess a, a different kinds of skills high tech skills for your students. Um, some minor theater upgrades we saw some you know just deficiencies as we went through the buildings and looked at it in terms of storage and how things are being stored uh some seating areas that, that have been put put in place and really need some improvements to, uh, to bring those uh, kind of up to current standards or new standards uh, and, and i don't want to say security fencing but some security measures so that we can't just drive onto the campus it really wasn't necessarily a fencing issue uh, and so it was really just about how do we protect the students, you know, that are walking on campus from an errant vehicle. And so we'll go ahead and, and go through these. This is kind of the existing condition. And, and I do want to, you know, we were fortunate enough to be a part of it, but I think the, the field out here has been a tremendous success. And I think it's uh, influenced some of the input from that. I think members of the, the staff from the ad hoc community, community committee um, have heard from the community that that's an important piece of this. Um, and so we also looked at the different areas on the campus and started looking at those. So just starting from uh, the gymnasium facility, looking at um, what do we need to do? And so I'm just going to go to this, actually I'm going to go to the next diagram 
And so what it needs to do is to expand the back of that gymnasium so that we can bring the bleachers back away from the, the side of the court. Uh, and so structurally, we have to go in and we have to modify that wall, uh, do some upgrades, and then build a small addition onto the gymnasiums to make it more usable. And so that was, this is kind of what that would start to look like in terms of the massing of, you see the, <clears throat> excuse me, on the left-hand side is the existing wall. And then we'd be doing a small uh, lower addition onto that to basically house the bleachers, if you will. Um, I'm gonna go back just real quick to the site diagram, if I can. Uh, so the other, Orange area there is looking at that maker space. Uh, what could we do with that? We identified some funds and possible projects there. And then there was some things in the courtyard where we add some shaded shelters, areas for students to sit, but also uh, enhancing the science program and bringing that up front. Currently, um, science has a, a community garden and greenhouse space kind of on the back side of the building, but their science labs are all uh, right over here on the main quad. And so there was a desire to link those two and make that more cohesive in terms of the learning environment. And then just looking at a couple other areas around the campus uh, that could be enhanced for learning outside. And so that's kind of the scope of work that was identified uh, at the Thurston campus. And so looking at the, the costs at this site, uh, that gymnasium expansion, is kind of the, the largest item, uh, about 1.8 million. Uh, that tech lab maker space doing a modernization. And again, these are not finalized numbers. This is really just providing a quick budget based on you know other projects of this type that we work with all the time, uh, but they can be scaled back and, and looked at as, as the need arises as you go forward into design. But what you really wanna do is identify some type of budget for what these programs might entail. Uh, the greenhouse, uh, the courtyard shade areas, the little theater, some type of fencing measures or, or actually security measures. And that might be just bollards or something that prevents a vehicle from entering the campus. And then those outdoor learning areas. And so those are the improvements that were identified at Thurston as we went through it with the site staff and also the committee. Are we following the same plan and taking questions and comments now? Yes, okay. I think that was the... Board members? So I actually, um, I, I like these plans. And I think that what happened in the back is really beautiful. I'm there every afternoon almost with my 11-year-old who will be at school here next year. It's reminding me of a question, though, that is a bigger question and goes back to the high school project, and that's the use of turf. Um, in the, I'm just trying to understand the pros and cons. So obviously yeah. the pro is that we save a lot of money on maintenance and water, and that may be the most important thing. But I'm also curious um, about the longer term use of turf and whether like there's other sustainability issues in terms of the plastic that's used or whatever. So I don't know enough about turf, but I figured this was a, a good time to ask since it's on the table as part of the project. I'm just trying to learn. Well, turf varies significantly from one manufacturer, one product to the other. And so it's finding the most sustainable uh, product that you can utilize in terms of the long-term long life of that product. Overall, the life cycle cost of turf is less than a natural tur natural sod field. Um, what's really critical, though, is the infill material. And so you've probably been to those fields where you see the the black uh, rubber particles, and they, you know, you and your athletes slide across those, and they go flying up in the air and that kind of thing. And that's really an older technology, and it's not one that we would utilize. Uh, and so we would look at something like what we did down at the, the stadium at the high school uh, several years ago, uh, and it's a more organic infill that we put in that that um, is more sustainable and safer for the students. Um, so yeah, does it I have an impact on the environment though, like the birds or the? <laughs> Not that we want <laughs> birds hanging out on our fields, but uh... yeah. Um, 
I'd have to get back to you on that. I have not seen any detrimental study or any detrimental articles on, you know, the impact on wildlife and that from artificial turf, but. Uh, yeah, it just makes me wonder sure. if like we do this thing that saves us a lot of money and that's great. I'm all for that. Yeah. And then will people look at us 20 years from now and be like, what were they thinking? Putting all this turf in and taking out the natural grass. So Jeff, can it. you speak to our experiences and what you've found out? Speaker, okay. So uh, excellent question. I, I love uh, synthetic turf projects, but it is, as uh, Roger stated, it could vary wildly between. Um, one of the other major benefits, an additional water saving, because I think that's one of the bigger benefits, is the playability and usability of those fields in inclement weather. So like if you have a rainy day, you can be on that field 15 minutes after it stops raining and it's ready to go. Whereas if it's a natural field, you're going to obviously have some dry time and it, it's going to cause damage if you play on a wet field. So that's significant. Um, in terms of our experience with our with our fields um, and the products we choose, we were very much considered um, the sustainability components of both the short and long term, and that's why we got away from the recycled tire rubber that's used as an infill and was commonly used in the past. Um, and we went with it's really it's a sand it's it's a it's a covered sand product. Um, it's naturally occurring. It actually comes from um, Death Valley. So it's a it's a natural product. It goes into the turf itself is like a plastic or a nylon, and it's commonly used in a lot of our textiles and manufacturing. So there is nothing anymore in the turf systems that we would think could be a problem, but it's something we're always paying attention to as far as technologies that exist. Yeah. Okay, that's helpful. Thank you. One of the other things, just real quickly, in terms of what we heard tonight, is you know, do we want to consider lighting of any of the fields, whether it's at Thurston or any of the elementary school fields? So. Yeah, I'd love at some point to have more information on um, lighting and how that's changed. We heard some comments on tennis lighting, and um, I um, have noticed the temporary lighting that's being used by somebody that is um, under facilities use agreement to use the field, and it's hardly noticeable, So, which is shocking to me um, and makes me reconsider the concept of lighting, meaning that I'd love to know if the lighting has come a long way and it can be lit without disrupting the other neighborhoods, um, that that's really important because as such a small community, I think every time we develop a field, we have to think of the community use. We have too few fields and the city and the school district have to, we've got to get them right when we do them. And Thurston was a case study of success of how that field is used every minute now until nine o'clock and it was not before you could not play you know um sports organized sports on it prior so um joan the other thing that i would point out is we also get a lot of gopher damage on fields so i have a little bit of experience with that which means that you're um, doing a lot more integrated pest management um you have i haven't ever seen birds on the elementary school field i spent a lot of time looking at it because there's so many kids on it but i do see gopher damage and that's an area that you can um, sprain an ankle it's an area where we need more um, chemicals or rodenticides in our schools which we really don't want so that would be a small but interesting natural benefit to using an inorganic product so yeah so back to uh, dr Monchesky's point i think the best example i can provide of of really being thoughtful around not turfing everything. I think that's, I think to your point, like in 20 years, are we gonna turn around and be like, we turfed every square inch, like we got rid of concrete and everything's turf now. Um, we, I don't think you want, we wanna do that. We wanna make sure that we have that natural environment. So like, for example, the Thurston Field is a great example. It's rimmed um, around in, in many spots with, you know, uh, drought tolerant plants. And so that you are still having that natural barrier. So it's not, you know, wall to wall turf. Cause I, I mean, I've been to, uh, Laguna Hills High School is a great example. They have an upper field that's all turf. They use that black rubber, and it is literally from you step off the asphalt all the way over. There is not, there is no natural. There are no trees. There's nothing. And I think that for our community, that's not the way we we would want to do it. And and so I think you bring up a really good point that if we look back and we turfed everything and we take out all the the, the green um, life and and install green synthetic. You know, are we going to re reflect back and say we should never, have, we shouldn't have done that? So I think looking at the fields and looking at what we've tried to accomplish and what I think Rogers point out too, using shade structures but also using trees 
to allow and increase our, our shade. Um, I know that's a that's an area that the state's also been talking about because a lot of schools in, um, in more inner city areas don't have any kind of green trees. And so we want to make sure you know, our students have access to that in those, those sections. And so, and then as race to, relates to lighting, I mean, that's been an ongoing conversation, I think, around here for a long time. Um, the, the lighting, and, and I know Ryan could probably give you a bunch of research, and we put something in the weekly update on it, but the lighting has become so much better, so directional. Um, it, uh, the, the LED lights uh, taking way more, less electricity. Um, we've done some of that retrofitting on some of our facilities so far. Um, but what you're what you are seeing on the fields at nighttime are LED lights that are directional because they're really low and they don't consume a lot of energy so they can just pad, power them up with a battery. Um, and so uh, we've talked a little bit about, you know, how could we potentially light, you know, El Moro field is a good example of a location we can maybe light um, uh, as, a, as a test case to see how it goes. So I think those are things that we can add in. The other thing around the sand volleyball. Uh, though you won't see it reflected on the plans um, at both the elementary schools, you know those are things that we've been talking about and and you know we would definitely consider as we get into more planning. Um, and that's what this is a great opportunity for us to hear from the board around. Are there things elements missing, things we may have left out, but we you know we did want to include um, and just didn't, didn't, we don't have it on there. So please, as we get you know as each project comes up, if you're seeing something like that, please make sure you mention it so we can note it as well. I would like to go from the ground to the sky. Solar. Uh, what are our plans for putting solar into our upgrades? I think sustainability is going to be very important going forward. And so as we go into these design processes for these projects, that's going to be a consideration. And it's, I mean, correct me if I'm not wrong, it's already part of building code where it's a requirement. But um, yeah, we'll have an opportunity to definitely implement some of those sustainability measures with these projects. Roger, did you guys consider um, shade over the existing back amphitheater on this site? We did look at that, uh, and that's a part of the enhancements. Of that. Yeah, because some of the facilities are underutilized, mostly exactly. maybe due to shade or um, a little piece of it needs to be modernized. It doesn't need to be torn down. It just needs some additional investment. You know, you have, you want outdoor learning spaces where you have a beautiful amphitheater, maybe not with great landscaping and without shade. So add that and yeah. you've got your own business. Yeah, okay. exactly. We have input from our students, please. If you have any questions or comments on this, uh, there's some plans. No, okay, <laughs> thank you. Any other board questions or comments before we move? Oh, I wanted to add some Thurston student comments that they're curious where the basketball court lines went. So I don't know if that came up in the walk of that uh, site, but I know there's pickleball lines and I think there's volleyball lines, but they are basketball courts and they're shown in these plans as basketball courts. So. Um, during the, the recent coding done out there, that was just coordinated with the site PE department site um so if uh, additional lines are needed they can be added at any time they wanted to start with that see how it played and then go from there nothing that's a big deal to add to add some more striping out there thank you any other questions or comments thank you move to top of the world please excellent so moving to top of the world um when we started talking with the site staff, um, some of the things that were important to them obviously was the universal transitional kindergarten, uh, making sure that we took care of that, providing playground spaces. And there are also legal requirements for the size of the classrooms that need to be um, provided for them, restrooms for them as a part of that. Um, we looked at play field upgrades. And again, this is one and, and at the pleasure of the board and the community of providing the artificial turf there uh, to provide that usability and that uh, use of the fields. Um, outdoor learning areas, and we'll, we'll look at that in just a moment. And then we looked at kind of a, a sort of a major one of uh, the existing lunch shelter uh, and where it's at and how it kind of interrupts the flow of the campus uh, and where their food service, the uh, food service, the kitchen facility is very small at this site. 
Uh, and so providing them with a facility that really meets the needs of the students out there. So let's take a look. This is what uh, the campus looks like uh, right now. And I do want to point out something kind of in the far right hand corner. Some of your or most of you are probably all aware of it. I'm preaching to the choir here, but uh, is a community garden that's out there, but it's really not usable for students. And so um, making that was, uh, usable for students was one of the other I items that we looked at. So if you see, I'm going to start uh, with the play fields and that kind of into the campus. Uh, we started looking at how could we develop something similar where you have that soccer field, that playability. Uh, you could keep some of the campus as natural turf and some of it with the artificial turf, again, depending on uh, where the board wants to go with that. We developed the idea of a pathway out to that garden so that could be used with science programs or with the community in conjunction with them. And we actually pulled a outdoor learning area that was kind of remote uh, back over uh, by the, the three modular classrooms uh, that were put out there, kind of out by the field area, if you will. I don't know if we can point to that or if I can. I don't know that I can, which is right in, in this zone right here, uh, looking at that. Um, we developed the idea of a small maker space, teaching students at a very early age how to do 3D printing and those technical skills, but also get them involved in art projects and those types of learning opportunities that they may not have right now. Um, the TK program, and you see that in kind of in orange, we developed a couple classrooms, expanding the capabilities for your kindergarten and TK at the site. Uh, providing classroom spaces for them, but also, and that takes up some more room. So we took over some classrooms in that adjacent building and then developed the playground so that it works for both the kindergarten and uh, the TK children. And then I talked about the kind of the, one of the big ones was pulling that food service area. And so what we identified was a new kitchen facility which is kind of on the lower campus now instead of being back up at the multi-purpose room. Uh, with a new lunch shelter that kind of makes that transition. It brings it out there to where they're immediately adjacent to the playground area uh, and out to the, the fields. And so they can go directly from uh, their lunch activity out to where they're playing at recess. And the idea there was that lunch shelter could you know, cut down from three or four lunches that they currently have down to just two, plus the ones that would be separate for the kindergarten and, and the TK. And so that was kind of the, the plan that we looked at for top of the world. And just going to some of the costs, obviously the, the restroom and the kitchen facility is the, the biggest item here. Uh, and that's about 2.5 million preliminarily. Uh, the new lunch shelter, um, the makerspace remodel, and that's an existing building. Uh, we're not really, other than the kitchen, we're not adding new buildings here. Um, uh, but we do take over that old kitchen. And so there's a custodial mod in there and storage and that, that becomes a part of that. Uh, the TK and the playground area, uh, that's some significant modernization and then upgrades to the playground areas. And then some outdoor learning areas that I talked about and the play field upgrades. And that kind of identified the scope of work that the, the site and the committee talked about as we went through that site. Thank you. Questions, comments? Roger, for this, the siting of the new lunch shelter, can you um, give me a sense of how far away from the current shade, shade structure this new one is? It's okay. actually right in the same location as right now you have existing restrooms right there in the very center of the campus. Mm -hmm. uh, right now you have those shade shelters that kind of uh, traverse the center uh, quad of the campus. And so what this does is pulls that further out. Um, and I'll just go to the next page. Pulls that further away from that and returns some of that back to uh, the students, and but also introduces maybe some landscaping and more sustainable environment rather than just all the concrete in that center quad. Uh, that was kind of a voice as a negative out there at that campus. 
Uh, but again, that you know can come out through the design of whether we want to keep all of that shade structures versus maybe some more natural shade elements of trees and landscaping in that courtyard. And then on the new lunch shelter, 3,000 square feet, Mm -hmm. Sorry, pardon me, the, the food service at 3,000 square feet. Yes. Can you talk to us about what um, type of opportunities for improved student nutrition that square footage of a kitchen would open up? Because yeah. I've heard that over and over again yeah. in the last decade. We can't wash dishes. We don't have space for dishwashers. We can't chop stuff fresh. We don't have enough space to do that type of cooking. Yeah, so some of the things that are happening is you have new nutrition standards that are coming uh, and so providing uh, fresh cooked vegetables or fresh vegetables, fruit and vegetables for students. So you need more space for storage, for refrigeration, uh, freezers and that. And so this would provide the opportunity for you to have that, uh, but also just quicker service for your students. And I know Jeff wants to chime in on this one. Okay. Thank just you. to give a specific example, um, top of the world right now can't prepare like boil water for pasta because the kitchen's so small. So we have to ship it up from the high school. So a simple function of, of that would be alleviated um, just given the additional square footage. Does it have to be 3000 square feet? This is a generic number used for planning purposes. Um, but if you get a chance to build a new any facility, you're gonna optimize the capabilities of that facility for sure. So the current kitchen at top of the world is about how many square feet? Do you guys know? <laughs> I know don't laugh, but it's I'm a, just trying to compare. Yeah. It's about 450 square feet. 450, okay. Now it's it's this large that also includes restrooms though. And so part of this is a kitchen and restroom. So typically when we're doing an elementary school kitchen, we would be about 16, 1800 square feet. And then the rest of that is the restrooms and then support for custodial electrical data rooms and that kind of thing. Okay, so like if we're going from 450 even to 1600 or almost a 4X on yes. the size of the food prep. Okay, that makes sense, thank you. It's a currently very limited kitchen facility. Um, and I would just, I, when we did the site tour, there was really a desire to change that whole concrete area and to bring in more uh, natural plants and to, you know, whatever it would be, because it's just so much concrete. Any other board member questions or comments on the plans at top of the world? Students, no, <laughs> you left that section behind. <laughs> Thank you. Move on to El Moro. Last but not least, um, El Moro. Uh, one of the things we, well, some of the things that you're gonna see common uh, with the other sites is the outdoor learning areas, the play field upgrades, spaces between classrooms. Um, there's a small identified area here in terms of administration. Uh, it's a very small expansion of that. Uh, NPR modernization, they have a space kind of in the back of that facility and was expressed a need to have kind of a wellness and, and kind of a multiple use. Uh, that they can have different groups in there at one time and the ability to separate that off for providing those other uh, mental health and other site support services for students in that facility. Um, universal uh, transitional kindergarten uh, and kindergarten upgrades was significant here. And one of the things that came out of that study was put, putting more emphasis at El Moro uh, versus top of the world. And so you're seeing more improvements in that area and those take up more space. And so I just wanna you know, uh, preface that. And then some of the site improvements um, uh, as we went through that. And so this is the, the site um, as it is today. Uh, one of the challenges that it has is, and it you know, really is, is kind of difficult is site circulation and drop off. Uh, for parents, uh, but I think you, you make the best of it or, you know, uh, that you can out here without significantly tearing down major portions of the, the existing campus. And that wasn't a priority uh, of the committee or of the site. Um, but looking at how can you improve that traffic flow was also just a, a sidelight of what we talked about. 
I'm just going to jump over to this. Um, the kind of the area in orange up there is building upon the existing kindergarten and then expanding that with additional two classrooms uh, for the transitional kindergarten and then providing play areas for them. Um, I talked about the, the other orange area in the back of the multi-purpose room was that kind of wellness center of creating that separate area so that they can have multiple programs going at one time in the, in the multi-purpose room. Uh, one of the things we looked at was you have an old relocatable out there for the preschool program, and it sits there where we're identifying a new two-story classroom building. Now, does it need to be a two-story? Maybe not. I think through study, you can look at site utilization, and maybe there's other ways to do that. But the idea of that was identifying where we can have areas for music, where we can have areas for science at this site, and then replacing the additional or the classrooms that we would be taking out in that last building, which is kind of in a less than stellar condition. Uh, it was kind of judged one of the, the least desirable buildings on the campus. Uh, and then the other item we looked at was the spaces between the buildings, which are very passive right now, and they're not utilized of creating outdoor areas where students could spill out to the outside, be able to use that natural environment between the buildings. And so we allocated some cost there. Uh, one of the other things is out by the two-story building that you have kind of off of the playground area there, we had moved kind of the site or the uh, community garden as a part of the science program and brought that uh, out to that area and then made the field more efficient. Now, that could stay where it's at and still do the, the improvements. And so you don't have to do that. And maybe that's part of the study as you go forward. But really what the master plan is looking at is these are the components that the committee and the site identified uh, that were important to them uh, to include in the master plan for you tonight and to at least start the discussion of those. And so as we looked at the, the cost of these, obviously the, the largest one is the two-story classroom building. Uh, and unfortunately, just construction costs are very high right now. Um, um, the MPR, the modernization there is you know, a somewhat low number. Um, the UTK um, and then the kindergarten and playground areas, just looking at that, that's providing restrooms right now. You only have certain classrooms that have the restrooms that are required under Title V uh, for kindergartens and, and TK. And so there's some significant improvements there. Also, the play field upgrades going to that artificial turf and, and providing that, the outdoor learning areas between buildings and then some miscellaneous site improvements. Uh, like I talked about with the science garden. And so that. Questions and comments? Sure. Roger, is the outdoor performance area, is that um, in the same site that their lunch shelter is right now? It is, and what we're proposing is moving that existing lunch shelter. And that's actually a relocation. Um, that area again that's a matter of you know how we how you would ultimately design that mm -hmm. um, but providing access uh, through that area but having the music be able to spill out outside uh, would be a part of that but that could come out through the design maybe music goes out in a facility by itself in another location and that could mitigate even some of the acoustic issues that you might have with a music program okay and then my second question is just on the compliance with the TK or, or kinder, even our existing yeah. kinder and TK rooms. Is it possible to add restrooms, which have anybody that's had a four or five-year-old knows that, that that provides a lot of value if you can have a, a restroom and be compliant. Can you do that without getting to the required square footage of a new classroom? Because I know we're out of compliance on the square footage and the restroom, but it's existing. But if we go in and just add a restroom, do we have to bring the square footage up too? Um, yes and no. <laughs> okay, the answer to that is technically yes to be compliant with Title V. However, the only entity that's going to check that would be California Department of Education. If you don't go through state funding and submit your plans to the California Department of Education, all you're going to have is a letter from me saying you're not compliant with Title V. Can you do it? Yes. A lot of districts do that. 
So we could potentially retain classrooms without having to say, take three classrooms, turn them into two because per yes. requirements, they need more square footage, right? Yes. You know, little four-year-olds take up more room because they're rambunctious than 12-year-olds. We could do that, keep them the same size, but add restrooms. So we could solve some of the issues. Yes. Okay, gotcha. Anyone else? Are there board members have questions, comments? This is a far out comment, you know, I'm capable of doing it. Um, with declining population of school age children in California and in the United States, um, could we at all be planning for um, mixed use of this facility in the future? Um, I, I went to Brandeis University and when it started, they built the first dorms on the road if the, if the university failed, they were going to sell them as motels. And <laughs> so uh, I'm just wondering, and there's a, a number of places where they are converting schools already into uh, senior housing and stuff like that. Um, I, I have all the optimism in the world that we're going to turn around our numbers, but I'm afraid that that's not what has happened nationwide. In fact, it's creeping from the East Coast to the West Coast, and it has arrived here. We are seeing it in terms of full sites being converted to other uses. We not seeing it where it's a mixed use because you really run into the whole idea of fingerprinting requirements, the education code, and, and some of those issues that would be problematic to have adults and students on a similar campus. Could you do it? And uh, I'm not sure that it would be feasible at this site, uh, but it's certainly something that you could look at in terms of what those joint uses could be. You know? to step on district toes. I think you're re almost referring to what the NCR did with Aliso. But it's not a but it's not a mixed use. It's just a new use. Yeah. Um are there questions or comments on on this? I have a concern that I am raising it. Oh students, do you have a <laughs> raising on uh between top of the world and El Moro and referencing in a sense what Dr. Kelly's bringing up because California is experiencing the declines. Um, some districts far more than others and certainly far more than what we've experienced. But I am concerned with what I'm hearing on the numbers on TK and it's, it's not materializing in some places. And so my concern is that we prepare both sites because we were, I think initially we were thinking that we wanted students to be able to start TK at a site where they would continue on through fifth grade. But if we don't have the students, then we will have two sites that we've built out and we really would only need them at one site. And I don't know how, I, I don't have the answer to that. I don't know how we determine that, um, trying to look into the future and, uh, and looking at the cost that it is to provide those facilities. So that's, I'm just raising that as a, as a concern as, as we go forward. Yeah, and I think if you look, um, you know, we've built out on this plan, you have, you have essentially four, I would, I would guess, well, five kinder TK rooms, right? Um, and right now we have uh, four that were in use, right? That's there at that school site, right? Without the continued expansion at El Moro. And what you saw at top of the world was a scaled back version, right? We we did scale that back um, for that very reason. Um, one of the, uh, if you recall the study, when we brought it feasibility wise previously, um, there was potential to take even additional classrooms in that lower building and add another TK room, which would have taken essentially four classrooms, regular classrooms away. Um, and uh, we decided against bringing that forward as a, as a recommendation to your point of, you know, we're, the numbers continue to be fairly good at kinder at uh, top of the world. We'll be, we're interested to see what they look like this year at El Moro. Um, TK numbers at El Moro are strong um, this year. Um, but again, we're not sure what it'll look like. And I think statewide, that's been one of the reasons the governor actually is making a reduction to this TK budget for facilities in particular. Um, is and is simply because the uptake hasn't been as strong as I think he was expecting it to be. Um, but that, you know, as you expand 
months, you're naturally going to have more students who are eligible. And so just by that natural, you're going to increase. But to your question, I don't know that we can, we're going to be able to know how much it will increase um, until we get through maybe a year or two to see, you know, as the system kind of gets into its regular motions and people realize that we're offering it, um, that, uh, you know, we will, as it's still in its infancy, kind of grow it out. Um, that being said, and I think to Roger's point, you can put a kinder classroom in, an, in a 960 space. Um, and we do that right now at top of the world. Um, we have two classrooms that are in standard classroom sizes. Um, and uh, so that's why philosophically we say, well, let's build a TK room at top of the world. We'll have another space there uh, to meet the needs of the at least one kinder class that's currently displaced. Um, but we can always move a kinder class into one of those other spaces. Um, as needed. So we're, I think we're trying to be as um, thoughtful as possible, not to take more classes off the campus um, in terms of rooms. Um, and, uh, but also, you know, recognize that we, what we're trying to build oftentimes is um, uh, looking at what we're currently facing without the unknown of how it, things could impact us five to seven years from now, right? Um, and, you know, we've seen it, when the economy and the and property values drop, you see more people being able to potentially move into town. We saw that at one point, and you see the populations go up in the schools, and then you see them, you know, slowly as they matriculate out. You don't have a huge turnover in homes um, and with kids coming in like some other areas have seen. So, again, it, it is hard for us to estimate some of those, and we're not alone. I know, you know a lot of districts are looking at that. Um, but right now, we, we continue to kind of believe that we do these little modern modifications, um, you know, it allows us to at least meet the needs uh, at the minimum, right? So, Jason, no, oh, I'm no, sorry. I'm sorry. I thought you were going to. How many hours a day does TK meet? We do half day with an overlap. Yeah. I mean, if I had my kids here when they were younger and my option was two hours or to get a nanny, I wouldn't use TK either because working parents, it's, it doesn't really work. Yeah, I mean, so we, we combine with Boys and Girls Club so the students can go over there for a full day program. Um, and we've talked about that and we'll bring it back to the board for further conversation because if, if there is interest in what is on this plan as well in the top left hand corner of the buildings is an actual preschool space, right? Um, so if we have interest to start running a preschool, you know, which would be potentially a longer day program, you know, what will, would we do around the TK program too? So there's some blending of, of those options. So I think that's kind of what we're trying to, to design. Um, at least our team has been talking about is, is maintaining flexible and adaptable spaces that can meet the needs of kind of the lower level students, preschool all the way up through um, uh, kinder, um, knowing they have the unique needs, right? They need the smaller toilets, they need bigger spaces, they need places for napping, they need, so the square footage does, and I mean, we were, I was talking to the students about it and I said, it's odd that the littlest kids need the biggest square footage, but that's just because yeah, it's the nature that's, of program, right? Okay. Yeah. So, um, but I think to your point, you know, it, the design of the program um, is one of the things that may dictate whether we have uptake and enrollment and that's dependent if the board wishes us to kind of go look at another option, we could do that. Right now, we wouldn't do that because we definitely don't have the space if it was yeah. all of a sudden well, to come. But it's also it. separate from this conversation. But yeah. I just think working, like I would have felt, I, working parents that I know would not want to put a TK student into a two hour program and then put them on a school bus. It, you know, I would not have been comfortable doing that. It's a long bus ride in the middle of the day. And when you're talking about, preschool when you say a longer day then you're actually getting into child care yeah you're talking yeah. about child care at, at that point so yeah you would have you know a program that that when he's mentioning that we you might in the future look at having a preschool for a longer day then that is not just a, a preschool that's actually child care so it's pre it's a, it would be a preschool a preschool that offers like full day yeah care. but tk all day I mean, why do we only have to do two hours of TK? Or it's not two hours. No, it's not two hours. Three two hours. And there's I mean, why not full day TK? Right. And that could be an option that is is the board so, yeah. talks about, right? And so the, the key for me as um is making sure that we have the facilities to to provide that. Of course. Right. So I have staff who are wondering, okay, so if this is the direction we want to go, that the board says, hey, yes, let's kind of move forward with this, then we can bring back, you know, some plans around 
preschool. Right, but I was just responding so, to yeah. the comment that there didn't seem to be as much of an uptake in interest. And uh -huh. I'm saying, well, maybe parents who work don't feel like it's a program that and, meets their needs. 100%. And also locally, right. some of that is that the local preschools uh, are offering programs that would compete with that, even, even referring to them as TK. Yeah, we have so, actually a full list of all the programs in right. that run preschool around here and what their length of times are. Um, they don't want to lose uh, their business. And that, I think, to your to your point, um, Member Malchowski, if we if this is something we want to do, and and we're open to doing that as um, as a staff, then we want to make sure we can get a facility to do it, and we can inter we can make it do in short term, and figure out ways to to make it happen. Um, but we wanted to have actually this conversation first to see where the board direction was around this a little bit, specific to the facility, because then that can guide our next steps with the board around what our programming could look like and shifting. So I appreciate you bringing that up. Remind I have a question me what the staff student ratio for TK for four year olds is as opposed to preschool. Staff ratio for preschool. One to 12. Thank you. Thank you. So, Dr. Valoria, on the, the topic of preschool, while we're in deliberations on it, are we talking about we already have added the 13th grade board members? We know we're not receiving any state funding for us to have universal TK at this point. Correct. Because of our funding model. So we've got a whole nother grade that we're adding into the general budget. For many districts, that would mean cutting programs. We might not see that painful piece, but it's definitely will cut into it as it grows. So on preschool, are we talking about a four a pay preschool or are we talking about special ed preschool? Uh, Fee-based preschool fee -based. that would allow our special education students who are currently in our preschool program to integrate um, with our general ed peers, as, which is something we need to do. Um, but it would be fee based for for um, for folks. Yes. Okay. So this actually. would be these would basically be three year olds that we're trying to serve because four year old would be in the TK, TK program. program. So we're talking about serving three year olds in a, in a fee based uh, private preschool program. Okay. Which we would we again if we build it if that's the interest of the board to build something like that then we would come back and talk about what that could potentially look like and let the board weigh in on what they'd like to see on that. So. Um, I know we have uh, staff ready and prepared to do whatever it is that uh, the board wishes on that, uh, but we didn't want to get bring that forward until such time as we had this conversation. So. I'm sorry, I might have missed this, but with declining enrollment, aren't there, aren't there some grade levels that don't have the, don't, like maybe a, a second grade had four classes and four teachers, and the next year they only expect three? is what's going on there for enrollment around the um our projections show um you know the site right now at El Moro for example you know are it was that kinder class an anomaly or was that what we expect to see in the out years and I can't tell you right um until we get to probably summer and then I'll be able to know kind of where the kinder numbers are landing and that has a ripple effect moving forward as we all recognize so right now we're feeling pretty strong that we're staffed where we're going to be staffed at there um, however if the numbers in kinder come in smaller then we'll you know we will have to make some potential adjustments down but we we're monitoring that um, we're monitoring our, our intra transfers interdistrict transfers that we allow kids to move from El Moro on top of the world and vice versa to say maybe this Maybe there won't be space available because there's plenty of space at the homeschool and the other schools impacted. So those are all conversations we're having, um, but we're we're pretty much staffed where we're, we believe we should be staffed. We don't have we're not going to lose anybody right now at this point. But I can say that we may have to transfer somebody if the kinder numbers don't come through. I mean, and so then would there be an extra kindergarten room? Would there be extra space? Potentially, correct. Right, and and so that was part of the discussion as well. We actually met today with the principals and talked about, you know, if we don't get these numbers, could we then have we'd have potentially a space that may become available for us to. Um, but when you're thinking long range planning, you know, what if the next year out we get back to where we were with 60 students at kinder, then we're we're going to need some a facility, and if we build it and then or build the program and don't have a facility to put it in, then we're then we're stuck, kind of stuck. Then we're moving people around again, and we don't really have that need. So, we're just trying to gauge the board's interest in us going down this pathway, um, so we can bring back some more specific concepts um, and work with the school side around that. And to your point, Member Perry, making sure that we're building it right sized, right, making sure that we're looking at it from all angles and. You know, if you take away a classroom, to your point, 
because we don't need that class, that teacher, and add a TK and a T, you know, two TK rooms there, then the impact's actually, instead of displacing three teachers, we might be displacing two, right? And so that's part of the conversation because ultimately we wouldn't have another teacher moving somewhere else because we don't may, maybe need that teacher in that in that grade level or whatever it might be. So um, it's the, uh, the the Rubik's cube of trying to figure out staffing and, and the numbers when it's really hard to gauge right now in our in post COVID in most any school district, you know. Um, and again, we're not alone on the TK uptake. It has been very slow because I think to your point, Ramon Chaska, if it's a partial day program. It can be hard for some working families to be able to say, yes, I can have my student. I want them on the bus. Some of them are willing just to say, no, I'd rather have them in a different program. Um, you know, there are discussions at the state level to mandate it. We'll see if that ends up happening when that would be really quite interesting. Um, but those are there are you know, ongoing conversations around that. So if that happens, I would see more than likely a, a push to make it more of a full day type of program, maybe more academic during one portion of the day and um, more kind of um, recreational and then the other. It is plays, plays their work. Is what, when we went to full day kinder, that was what was missing, right? Was the right. academic play side of the things, right? That we were able to reinstitute. So that was that was really important because I know people were concerned when we did reinstitute kinder that that was going to happen, where it was going to be an all academic day. And it was, no, this is playtime where they're actually getting social skills and the things that they don't necessarily get as much as they used to. So, right now, um, do we have staff utilizing our TK that have ones that age? So if, yeah, so next year I'm pretty certain we'll actually have at least one. Well, I mean, it was, site. I just was curious now, but it would, some years we would and some years we wouldn't. Right, just like, yeah. President Vickers, I had a, a comment I just want to share with fellow board members, specifically on the El Moro kind of holistically. Um, you know, there's one big project in here at 10, 10 million, and there's a bunch of other small, smaller projects. Um, the next biggest as the TK that we've just been talking about but we have declining enrollment. This is our smallest site. And I don't think that this space is fully utilized right now. Um, we obviously had some enrollment um, declines that we weren't expecting that were, you know, due to the TK uptake we just talked about, but we've got kinder classrooms with 12 to 13 students. We've got first grade classrooms with 15 to 16 students. I am all for small class sizes. But I don't think that we can be adding facilities without being at least to a standard what I would call an outstanding 20 to one ratio. So I don't think we can be saying, well, we need more classrooms here until we are staffing those classrooms back at what would be an appropriate Laguna Beach Unified ratio. So I don't, I don't wanna see this site more fully utilized. And I also, I don't support a two story building here based on that. So that's my, my comments. I just wanted to share them. So everybody knows where I stand on that. On the TK piece, I think we're in a unique spot. I don't know that it would be, we would be good fiscal stewards to say, let's build it or approve building it and see if they come. I think we kind of need to get a sense that they're coming before we build it. Um, that might be programmatic changes, but not facilities changes. And so, you know, if there's a need um, and it's really coming out of those sites to add restrooms and we have a workaround, there's something that enhances the student and the teacher experience without um, investing at this level. I think that that's better. I also think concentrating TK in one site where we're modernizing one site to make that really attractive to, to host most of the students, maybe not all, um, is a better long range plan than trying to develop and build it at two um, at a district our size and at a program of this size. So those are my, my kind of general comments on El Moro. Right, and just to clarify, we only do have it, like that was, that is exactly to your point, okay. building more of the, the early learning programs here and only building one TK program at top of the world, one room, because right now that's kind of what we're servicing um, and that we would push the overflow TK students to El Moro. Um, we weren't looking at building necessarily because 
it may sh show you two TK classrooms, but we're short a kinder classroom right now on top of the world. Similar to what you were saying, except reversed the schools. Right. Yeah, and, and maybe we as a board need to think about reversing that if we want more enrollment at, at El Moro as well, or maybe not. But right now I see 1.3 million on the top of the world page for UTK, and I see uh, 2.8 million for UTK at El Moro. And I'm actually not that comfortable with any of that until we see our TK numbers come in this year. You, you know, we really had much lower than expected enrollment in that in that that program. And it could be anomaly, but I think the board needs at least two years of data to authorize going forward with. I, I take your point, but I think that we need to think about program design and figure out why people are or aren't using it rather than just look at the number who enrolled. I mean, I'm a big supporter of TK programs and I think they should be all day. And so I think if people aren't coming, it's a good question to figure out why, because, you know, these are, you know, it's useful for early childhood education. And if we have, I mean, I wouldn't not build the space because people didn't come until we know why people didn't come. I think I've said that before about looking for the data, but it's hard to, it's hard to get. It takes some time to get it. Uh, I would just offer one idea from things that I've, heard out is that uh, there's a perception that class sizes are larger than you would find in preschool which and the answer to my question is it's the same so public school site and therefore it's going to be the same and there'll be you know 20 kids and so interesting thing is our our kids just start school later than what my older kids did mm -hmm. so it's it was very surprising to me when I moved here that my son was a year older than his grade in California so it seems very late for kids to anyway when I think to Roger's point when you to you, this earlier learning I mean again we, we have a director of early learning like this is we want to kind of build the programs out but to Roger's point, when you first started, related to that two-story building is specific to, we may not need a two-story building specifically. We can, we can spend some time if the board says, no, let's take a slower approach to the to the TK, thinking that we may have less. Let's, let's look at, as um, Member Osborne points out, space utilization a little bit more. Are there things that we can do there um, uh, and be a little more thoughtful, making some you know smaller breakout rooms for interventions, those sorts of things. And we can do that, and I and I think that's that would be a direction from the the board to say, like, let's go back and kind of look at programmatically how we're using all those spaces and and what some um, options are, and maybe it doesn't have to be you know two stories. Maybe as Roger said, you break the music room out into something different. Um, so we can do that, and that's 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 the purpose of tonight, right? Is really talk all that through. So thank you for all the feedback. I agree with everything Clerk Osborne said, and I think that many places don't. Um, are responding oh, well they're having a trouble with tk all over but some places are responding better because they don't have great preschool programs we have great preschool programs and many of the parents at least that i talk to the younger parents in our, my neighborhood don't want their child in school all day because they don't both work they are happy for their child to go just in the morning and have the afternoons with them yeah, but it's 2023 and lots of people are double working families. You know, I, I understand that many people are home. I get that. But there are lots of people who both people work. Yeah. So I think we need to be mindful of that also. I, I'm not disagreeing with you, but it's, you know. Mother community. Maybe it's really hard to go to work because we don't have a community that kind of supports the fact that there are two working people. Oh. It's it's shockingly difficult in Lagoon. Ooh, there's a spider above your head. Move back, move back. <laughs> it's really big. Look at it. Itsy bitsy spider. Dr. Valerius, yeah, I don't forget. have a napkin or anything. Maybe I can, let me grab one. <laughs> oh, you got it. Okay. 
Are we ready for? Yeah, that was it. Was a fire. <laughs> Yeah. There are six items on this. Deb, on this, Jeff, did you want have anything you wanted to say on this before we? Please, comment? yeah, I know, uh, and thank you, Roger, and your team for the presentation, and we hope you found it valuable. A lot of work went into it, so I'm happy to do one slide, and I'll do the last slide. Um, our next steps. Um, and so in, as bullets are put up here, um, you can see we want to plan our community engagement um, based on feedback or tweaks that we make to the plan that we get from you tonight. Um, that would be the finalized the general scopes of work. Again, not getting into design, but hearing some of the feedback I, I've got tonight as examples of additional next steps would be getting more information about field lighting. That was a, something that it seemed the board wanted. And also looking for opportunities to reduce uh, square footage or increase efficiencies. So rather than looking at a, more of a generic square footage look as we did tonight, where you had just plain square footages applied based on common practice, we're going to look and dial that back to get maximum efficiencies and consideration of how we would use those spaces um, so that we could see just how much it could shrink. Um, and that would be, again, still a, a master plan, but it wouldn't uh, hopefully get a little more efficient with our designing in the future. Um, and then I would group the last four bullets as a single directive that we would appreciate. And that would be what would financing look like? And when you look at financing, that's going to dictate a lot of the timelines and also other opportunities such as partnerships with the city of Laguna Beach. So that would be kind of the third big area that we would look to get direction if you want me to uh, pursue that for you. So with that, I would leave it to the board to discuss. I had a little bit different take on listening and making some notes that I look at one, three, and five as things that we need to address before we look at, like we get into finalizing things, particularly the first of getting the engagement and having information meetings and more than one. I know it's been suggested of meeting at the sites. Um, and then, but we really need to work with the city. We really need to find out where we stand with that. I think you would need that information to uh, look at financing options. So to, I, I would guess I would tie three and five together, but um, I just think we need to take those smaller steps before we can take the bigger steps. No, that's, that's just my, that's just me. That's no, I, I agree with you, President Vickers. I think before we take more steps, we should meet with the city. And I think we should also um, have a meeting with the community. I agree with both of those uh, steps, community meetings and meeting with the city. So I think um, the city, I think we could direct Dr. Valoria to meet uh, with his counterpart at the city along with uh, Mr. Dixon to share some of the results of tonight's session and start to determine what interest is there. I think we would, did you need to interrupt me? <laughs> okay. Um, I think that would be something that would be helpful um, if there's interest in from the board and seeing if there's joint use of opportunities, we would direct them to, to try and determine that. Is there an agreement that we need to do that? Definitely. I, that's definitely, what I yeah. thought okay. that's what I just said. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I was just trying to make sure we're all, I think that was one thing where I didn't see anybody that disagrees. We have current joint use agreements that go back to 1994, if not prior to that. We all know how they're structured. I think the city's um, interested and available um, and wants to talk with us. I'd like to add one thing to that, and that is um, uh, because parking and uh, traffic is such an important thing for the neighborhood. And I think that the parking committee would be the ideal place for the staff to uh, begin. Can I make a request to the board? Can we have the two or whoever, but I mean, it could be the two board members who are already on, on the ad hoc facilities committee meeting to, to be a part of those discussions as well. I think it's important that the board be a part of that. And cause I know they had the, the city committee has two members from to your point right. to, to that so maybe we could set something up that's joint with with them so it's just not staff i would, I would I, really, really I appreciate think it having should, i agree and we did, we did that i think with the tennis uh, i mean that's that was four hours here but i think we did it with the tennis discussion that, 
Is that okay? Yeah. Yes. I, I think it should be the whole board with the whole city council. St a starting point. Because we have a, we'll have a joint meeting coming up. Yes, we're going to have a right, joint meeting. Right, but they, now, they, now they put that off. If we can't even get a date to meet with them, uh, the whole board. We will get a two date. Years. We, we'll get a date. No, we put it off because of the pandemic. We'll get a date. <laughs> I think that that meeting where you have 10 in a room, we need to have some preliminary conversations so we're using our time wisely. We need to have some um, background data on where the city stands, even if it's a subcommittee from their um, city council and a subcommittee so that we can bring some options and good thinking. I think if we all just show up, the 10 of us, uh, that won't be an effective use of time. And it is very hard to get 10 people on a on a dais together. So I think but that I would just be purely more practical. Um, I also think it's important because there are there are new people in the city that don't have the background of partnerships with the school district on facility use. And I think we need to provide them with a perspective of what's gone before mm -hmm. from the pool to tennis courts to our joint use agreements going way back to theater use. I mean, so that they're familiar with what has taken place prior and what might go forward. The the two members of city council that are on their facilities are um, Alex Renaghi and and Mark, and they are both new. I mean, they do have some background, but that I can see how that might be helpful. Yeah, and I think that's why I think Dr. Kelly mentioned the parking committee because that um, that's uh, Bob and Sue. I think are the two that are the reps on that committee. So, um, so if, is the board comfortable if we go down that pathway? Parking committee. The two of you revisiting that is there a, I see it consensus okay well we'll definitely set that up Jen Does that work and it may be if you did hear a lot of feedback about a community engagement it might be worthwhile to try and meet or present at the next um, parking traffic and circulation subcommittee which is a larger group of residents and also at, I think there's a recreation committee to present the plan to those city subcommittees that include you know, five to nine residents. They also have a staff liaison, a city council liaison, but to make sure that we're communicating and getting input from both of those city subcommittees too, would the board be comfortable with that? Yeah. Okay. Just to get clarification, those, all those committees would be able to consider neighborhood impact, right? That's what they do. Yes. Okay. And if there's others that we're missing, I mean, those are from what we heard tonight, the biggest ones we heard parking and we heard a recreation traffic and uh, parking traffic and circulation is one committee recreation is another uh, but we could work with the city to get their next scheduled meeting and make a short presentation if they would entertain us jeff do you have any idea where the city is they're doing their a master plan master facilities plan also but what where they are in that process no it's actually um i received an email that they wanted that's one of the topics they wish to discuss with the board, I believe, um, and the joint meeting. So looking for time and and one of the, uh, the, the joint meeting will be longer um, because one, I think there's a lot of topics, um, joint use is one obviously that, uh, that they brought up, but also their facilities master plan, their long range, they wanted to have a discussion about that. So, um, so I think that's forthcoming. I haven't received any um, uh, more detail on it. I know that when I sp uh, spoke to the city manager before, she had made reference that she wanted the school district representation involved, but I wasn't. There was no plan yet of what that would might entail. So I'm assuming maybe at the joint meeting that will be di discussed, and so figure out how you, how they want to bring the okay. school district a part of it. Um, I'd like to consider our student reps also at some point in some of these other meetings because I think their input is valuable. Um, fellow board members, can we go back to that? I think it's bullet one, the conducting um, community engagement information meetings. And I just wanted to get some, some consensus amongst us about kind of when we want some of that to happen before we meet again. Um, I think there's a lot of community interest in this. So would we want those to happen kind of simultaneously to these conversations with the city? So we have some of that feedback before we have our joint meeting. Um, I just don't want a long span of time to occur 
um, before that, that I think the community's received a lot of really good information tonight and well, I, would I think they can move quickly. I would certainly think we'd want to do that before the school year ends, if we can, to get the at the site at the site levels. I would, yeah, I recommend doing it simultaneously because we run the risk of getting a lot of information and then coming back to people and having them feel like we're giving them information and not getting their input, right? So I, I think it's important to do both if that's possible. I think it's also important um, to speak with the staff at each of each of the sites because they have opinions about the two story at El Moro and what's going on at top of the world. And I'm sure Thurston and the high school staff also do. That's something the site supervisors could do. So is it feasible to think that we could maybe do these in four to six weeks? And we are we talking about a meeting at each site to kind of talk about the site-based plans or are we talking about maybe a, a big meeting where all the sites are represented and people can come? You, does I, the I board have an opinion on that? More site specific is so that you can be on the site because okay. people can see and, and you know just that adjacencies. Okay. The one thing I think that we would need some clarification on is as Roger started in with his initial comments just around you know the, the high school offices, classroom building, those spaces, and the fact that the, the square footage is, is a lot larger than what we had originally designed. Are we comfortable scaling that back? Because what I want to make sure that gets presented to the community is, is more a representation of what we're actually kind of thinking about. And right now, I mean, with I don't think we're landing that 20,000 is where you want to be at. We If we could scale that back, it would give a little bit better of a picture of what it actually it's going to kind of maybe be. I mean, not a, we're not going to get into architecturals and those sorts of things, but I think for, for Roger being able to say, okay, well, yeah, and then we, that pulls this back this much and, you know, we can look at some adjacencies, we can look at some ways to share space, how far, you know, how much can we pull back and, and then presenting that out to make it an accurate picture. I think there's certain things that we would need to be able to do to provide a better picture for folks. Um, which one? Oh, 20,000 square feet was what I was mentioning. Yeah. Yeah, not, yeah. yeah. I support pulling that back. I, I support. So we can, I would back. like to be able to have yeah, that and work, work with adjacencies a little bit. You know, I think we can probably get a team from the high school together and just kind of really talk about some basic flow of how things to, to Dr. Munchen. We can do that in a probably pretty quick timeline. Um, and, uh, and, and just, and then we can engage the community in what something is a little more like, okay, yeah, this is what it could it could feasibly and get some feedback from that and then uh, and go from there and i know the neighbors talking about the parking structure and what that might look like what that impact would be that that's a little bit easier because we already have that kind of more or less kind of figured out in a way and we you know we can uh, have a better picture of what that would be for them but i think that that corner it was one that comes up a lot and i recognize that and appreciate the feedback i i think that the site um discussions would be fine at El Moro, Thurston, top of the world, but the overall aquatic center and moving the tennis courts and all that, I think needs to be a whole a whole town discussion because there's many people affected. I would say it also should be a high school site yes. discussion because it is the high school site and it is high school athletics. I would not leave them out as, as far as a site discussion. I'm not saying oh, that we yeah, don't- They could have a separate site discussion. But, but I, mean, include, I think we need well, we, that's what we were saying. town hall for anybody who wants to say something. I think we said that also. I thought we did. Okay, so. Some other groups that I think we should reach out to. One's the Board of Realtors. I think it would be a, a good informational thing for them to know what we're doing. I always like uh, consulting with the heavens, so I was the Council of Churches. I think that would be another group that would be helpful as far as with getting information into the, into the community. Yeah, that, that does raise a good point, Dr. Kelly. So on these um, community engagement meetings, what is the method if you're not the parent um, of somebody in the district to become a, aware of it? And I'm not saying that we need to come up with a new method, but it's just good to know how would you, how would we get that noticing out that we're, we're going to plan a town hall and an community engagement meeting at the high school for Park Avenue block. Do we have ideas about that? Well, I, yeah, I mean, this, the one about tonight went out to everybody who received a school board. Did it go to the next cell? The whole thing 
Right, but the town, we could do, could we use that? I mean, there is one in the town because I get, it was in Stu News. You know, it's it, it's a problem that often surfaces is that whatever communication vehicles we use, there are people that are going to say, I didn't hear about it. So we have to tie up what we do as as much communication as we can do in different avenues. And then it's also, it's, it's it'll be redundant to you, personal responsibility. I mean, you know, if I, I try to follow like things in the city, it's where they know, notice in the paper, it can be hard to follow, but it isn't, they do put it there. Then it's up to me if I wanted to, to stay aware of that ordinance changes and things like that, but. Yeah, we definitely would reach out to the the local neighbors so that they're well well aware. I mean, that's Jeff's done that before previously with baseball work when we did that. That he went door to door and, and let them know, and um, we would definitely that would be an approach. And then just bring the bring everyone in and let them see, talk through, express their concerns around the different um, things that and likes and dislikes and areas and opportunities. Um, uh, and we'll we'll do that as well with the LDS Church as well because they're smack dab in the middle. Um, between both projects, um, so yeah, for sure. And like I said, this was this is for step one of of multiple options to, and times to get out to the broader community and and talk to them. But we want to get your feedback on what and who and exactly what we're actually sharing, right? So, so is this just along the lines of that? I think if we can do it in the next four to six weeks, it gives the community a kind of to Jan's point. Sorry, uh, President Vicker's point. Uh, uh, this meeting is going to be coming over the next four to six weeks, so I need to be paying attention, we can do our best job communicating it, but I think that would be a nice time frame. Is anybody opposed to that? Right. We've got spring break in the middle of that. So I think uh, probably by end of May, but might be, you know, okay. so uh, I don't know, what, I don't know Roger's schedule either. So I wouldn't want to speak for him, but yeah, I think- if Next can, four to eight weeks. <laughs> if we can, if we can okay. hit uh, by the end of May, we don't want to do a whole lot in the summertime because we recognize that people are gone. So as much as we can try to get ahead of it, I think is, is speed that up. Um, uh, but we want an effective timeline that people don't feel like it's rushed either, right? Yeah, Network. and I think um, to, I don't know who brought it up. One of my fellow board members did on, I think it was member Perry on, um, in these, we do need, if there's board direction, to certain things that it, we really would like to have added or we'd like to have deleted or scaled back, that's really helpful so that we're presenting an accurate plan. So these are smaller in nature, but we also heard about diving. We heard about sand volleyball. Um, we heard about definitely reducing the square footage of the district office. Um, we heard about better space utilization at, at El Moro. Unless anybody disagrees with those, I would expect to see those in the next versions that go out to the community. Okay. I have um, a couple other areas that I think that maybe we should ask the, the staff to look into. One is bond and indebtedness of similar sized school districts so that we have an idea about, about if, what dollar figure should we be looking at or it to be comparable to other school districts? And then the other thing would be once we get to the point as far as to look into uh, the groups that do bond studies, there, that there's groups out there that survey the community to find out how receptive the community is to a bond. And I think those, those two things are important for the, the final project. Yeah, and I, Ty, I think, oh, go ahead. I'll tie it in with that. Perhaps you could give us a summary of what we did with the previous bond and how favorably it went and how, and what we did to step that down for our citizens to lessen the, the impact and how soon it expires. And I don't know if there's consensus, but I, I think as we think about projects of this scope, even if it was just one of these, you know, or maybe two of them of the smaller ones, some of these financing strategies come into play. And I personally would, would like all of the things Dr. Kelly said, but I, I need to start seeing some of that information sooner rather than later. Um, I'd love to have, even if it's in a weekly update or if it's a short presentation in our April 20th meeting, I think we need to be really educated. We weren't on the board when the last bond was done. And so we need that historical information um, and background 
and it doesn't have to be full ways to finance this project. I think Member Vicker says she wasn't she wasn't there yet, but we need to start that conversation. Um, would that be possible? Yes. Okay. I think part of that with funding options, Jeff, is where where potentially some funds could come from as as preliminary information. I'm not opposed to preliminary information. I just think okay. as far as hard numbers that we need the other steps first. Yep. Yeah. We will look at, at all available financing options that we can find. Thank you. Yeah. No. <laughs> Thank you. I want to make sure that you get your chance. So do you have, have we given enough feedback? Oh. <laughs> or is in your uh, timeline, you know how we talked about hopefully that the uh, the aquatic center and pool would be number one and maybe uh, maybe Elmore would be the last one or the, you know, the schools that already have already. Yeah, yeah, as far as already are to me have our excellent sites. Uh, right. And that'd be part of it too. I mean, you can only manage so much work. Brian's over there like, yeah. Um, you can only manage so much work at a time. Now you can bring, you know, you can bring support on to make it happen. So you, we could run multiple projects at the same time, but we want to be mindful too. Of just of when you're doing funding, how you're going to fund it. What does that look like? Um, so that would become as you were get to scope of work to then bring that back to the board and start talking about priorities. So how do we want to prioritize what exactly is on the priority list? What does that look like? So that once we get firmer cost estimates, the board's starting to understand, okay, financing, cost estimates, are, do we be able to do everything on these lists? Or are we going to start saying, let's put that on the 20-year facilities master plan and not put it on the 10-year, right? And so we'll come back with, with that as we kind of scope the workout. Um, but, you know, one of the things that uh, Member Vickers, President Vickers had pointed out, is you know there's a couple of things that are still on our 10 year plan that we that we need to consider um and so when we bring that back we'll we'll make sure it's like here's here's where we are left off of the 10 year plan here's these things are still looming and then here's some of the potential you know next steps as we start to scope those out a little bit cleaner so and then we'll also know we'll have information about how much money we have to pursue a project for instance like i i personally really like the Thurston gym being expanded. And if we would have enough money to do that without a bond or without. Yeah, I think you'd have to just consider in totality, right? You can you can always take that approach um, and say, you know, let's, let's knock off a few projects that we know are, you know, we are easier to fund. But when you if you start doing that, then you might be taking away planning money to do the bar the larger projects. So that's why the board really will have to consider all of those pieces, right? And say, if we do these five smaller projects at you know seven million dollars, which we can afford, then we lose seven million dollars to maybe do some of the planning and get the ball rolling on one of the bigger projects. But that's really what you all have to discuss and make a determination when we bring it back, um, you know, and talk about financing and talk about private public partnerships, talk about city joint use, but you make a good point, member pair. There is a couple, you know, we use the term low hanging fruit, but there are some things that you can maybe just say, hey, we can, can we do these, you know, and could they happen over certain summers or whatever it might be and where, and where would it fall, right? So. Be particularly interested in those that would enhance the student experience. I think they would agree with that. Yeah. So. <laughs> and it is, um, there was a point made about increasing costs and I know that Jeff, and Ryan, they both know that, and Mr. Clark knows that, and we certainly experienced it here with Building P. Yes, as what it was a projected cost, and how many years we had to delay that, and what it actually ended up costing. Right. So that's, you know, it it'll affect what we do, and it'll affect, I think, some of our decisions. It is. It it reminded me tonight, the pool that exists now it had a diving board. I cannot tell you the reason they took it out but it did have a diving probably board. not yeah I'm not was, sure, i think there was just too many people so in it and we're talking about kids hitting each other right diving on each water. other I can imagine what it was like trying to have people diving into that pool uh, president Rickers, i was i was curious as dr valori alluded to the future prioritization that we need to do as a board out of tonight's three hours of, of conversation and um reports from roger thank you roger very much for all your work and the subcommittee work that brought this forward, um, you know, big thank you to 
uh, Sarah Duran and Steve Samwellian and all the site principals. That was a lot of work. But I'm curious from the board, is there anything that sticks out to you as like a as a priority? We we saw four sites and we saw a lot of we saw a lot of stuff here. We saw a lot of cheddar and dollars and we saw a lot of stuff, but is there anything that's sticking out? It's interesting when you ask that question because I think it's it's a complex question because the things that we delayed that were last on the list were the high school administration and then the district office, that they were like at the end of the line. So waiting their turn until things that really were in a sense more student serving were accomplished. So, um, but this is a whole different, very, very comprehensive plan. So at this point, it would be hard for me to say other than we've talked a lot about TK and that we need to be prepared for that. So, but it's, it, it, you know, I, I mean, it is really brought to the forefront uh, the whole pool issue, which is a real, a real lack for, for the community. And I, as I said before, I know that they have asked the city for a, a, maybe 10 years, I don't know how long, at least five years to address that. Yeah, I would just add, I, I think there's a really good case for figuring out what to do about the pool. And I, you know, how, however that ends up looking. And, and I already said, I think student services um, at the high school is, is very important just because of the kind of student needs we meet, need to meet there. But I think there's a lot of great things in here. I, you know, those, those are the low hanging fruits, as they say. This master plan has, like you said, a lot of great parts to it. I think I would prioritize the aquatic. on six uh, action item human resources uh, approval of phase two of agreement with our Ars Arsina risk group for insurance archaeology and claims advocacy who's ever said no public comments received. is there any public comment none received thank you uh, this is just phase two so um, we uh, engaged them early on to help us identify um, liability insurance coverage in the 80s and now we are needing them to help us identify it in the 70s and so um, we provided to date what we have um, they have been tendering insurance companies um, for a claim that was filed against the school district um, we we really need to have that their expertise um, to help kind of continue that work and so we're requesting that uh, for phase two to be implemented so new board questions do we expect this is a not to exceed 18,000 or is that just an estimate? A contract? So not to exceed 18. If we were to bring it back, the, if we did. bring it back for additional, yes. Thank you. Any other questions? I have a motion, please. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Carries 5 0. Uh, we need to have a motion to adjourn. A student vote. I didn't ask for your student vote on the last one. I apologize. I <laughs> okay. Student vote on adjourning. <laughs> Board members, all in favor? Aye. Opposed? Carries 5-0. I'm sorry. <laughs>